a duke named Cullen de Levelton asked his daughter, how would you feel about becoming my adopted daughter? Before you is a man in whose hands are concentrated the wealth and power of the entire kingdom, and the protagonist of the novel entitled, The Everyday Life of the Duke of Levelton's Family. Before us is presented a little girl named Le, who is the protagonist. She was a beggar girl who as if won the lottery. She had the honor of becoming his daughter. It seemed to her as if she had fallen into a sweet dream, but there was one but in this whole story. The protagonist of this novel was definitely a murderer. This was the very thing that confused the poor girl. The young little girl fought for a very long time over the proposal of the gentleman, and he had already thought about the fact that she would refuse, but let us take it all in order. Our heroine is so young she can't read, she's been learning everything on her own, and on this day she managed to read two words. A boy who was a friend of the heroine was interested in what the young lady was doing. He thought it was pointless to try to read if you can't even read. The princess assured the boy that she knew a few letters. She didn't want to be a beggar all her life, so she wanted to change her fate. And first of all, she wanted to find a job. The boy did not even understand the meanings of the words spoken from the lips of the young lady. Namely, he wondered what fate was and what it was to change fate. The young lady was upset because she realized that it was very difficult to influence fate. She needed to concentrate, but her friend distracted her with his questions. After the death of her mother, the young princess had to beg on the street. Her friends in misfortune claimed that passers-by gave her money for being nice, so they immediately told her when they found rich people. And if it was possible to get alms, they all together shared the bread among themselves and ate. Such was the life of the young lads in the street. One day the children were patting a young lady on the back so that she would pay attention to a tall man who looked like he had a lot of money. This man looked very solid. He was all in black and had a red tie. Also a very nice coat. Mo wanted to take a chance and didn't he realize that this meeting would change her whole life. She apologized for bothering the young gentleman and asked him for just one coin. When he looked at her, she realized how handsome the man was. But her expectations were in vain. He asked the young lady to step aside, for he was busy. Lee in her eyes saw a picture in front of her, a girl who was on the hospital ward reading a book. She immediately realized that this was her past life. Even though she was sick, she was smiling. And there was also a very important detail. The girl was reading a book titled, The Everyday Life of the Duke of Levelton's Family. This indicated that this book was about this young gentleman in a coat. The little girl saw these moments before her. Cullen had a mission. He was looking for a special criminal who had committed many criminal acts and was particularly dangerous. Cullen realized that he couldn't be late because the criminal could get on the train. The criminal was a man in a red cap, but Cullen did not realize it. After changing his clothes and hiding his face under the visor of the red cap, the perpetrator disappeared into the crowd of beggars. As Cullen ran toward the railroad station, the perpetrator massacred the poor. Thirty people were killed and his first victim was a poor little boy named Walter. These were lines from a book that young Lady Le had read in a past life. She realized that these terrible acts could happen right now. She realized that her friend Walter was in danger and she was ready to act. The girl warned Cullen de Levelton not to go to the railroad station. Many people would die if he did. The gentleman didn't know what the young lady was talking about. Le warned the gentleman that a bandit in a red cap had recently passed through here. She saw him pretend to be heading towards the station, but in fact he disappeared into an alley, and he looks exactly like the wanted demon killer William on the posters. All Cullen did was ask the young lady if it was true. The young lady was very excited and asked Cullen to be on time and come to the right place. He rushed to where the young lady pointed. After the master found the culprit, he used dark magic. Cullen takes immense pleasure in taking down bandits. The young lady realized that Cullen was like a psychopath when he said such things. Suddenly, the shouting stopped. The young lady realized that she had to run away from this place. Before she could run away, Cullen held the young princess back. She was frightened. Cullen was determined to ask her something. The poor girl was shaking with fear. People were screaming and running to where the cries were coming from. Cullen realized that there were going to be a lot of people here now. He held out his business card and stated that there were too many extra eyes to talk to here. He introduced himself as Cullen de Levelton and asked Lee to come to him. He was intent on discussing the help that had been rendered. 
our heroine lives in the fictional world of the novel, but she has the misfortune to be reborn as a penniless mass market character. Is this how her life will end? In total poverty? And she hasn't even tasted the sweets of this world? Our heroine in the next life be born healthy and happy. Among all her wishes, she realized that health is the most important. Flowers and papers with unidentified symbols fell into her hands and she felt a sense of surprise, unable to understand what it represented. Somewhere before, she had seen these letters before, but the memories remained vague. As she examined the symbols, the association with the letters on a business card suddenly occurred to her. The turnover stood as follows, the Duke of Levelton's family was actively seeking servants. A moment of thoughtfulness turned into the thought, perhaps this is my chance to change my fate. Among other things, Cullen had already mentioned that she should meet him, and that thought strengthened Luz's resolve to go to the meeting. The servant inquired, This is the card you claim to have received directly from the Duke? The Duke gave me this card and ordered me to appear, she confirmed her words. The lad appeared and, turning to the servant, inquired what had happened. The servant informed him that the girl claimed that the Duke had personally called this young girl to him. A thought flashed through the heroine's mind, isn't that Cullen's son Jade? And couldn't it be that Jade's father had a new hobby? Jade wondered. Le shows up in front of Duke Cullen's house and insists on meeting him immediately, claiming she has important business with him. Butler Jade opens the door and escorts Lee inside, instructing her to follow him somewhere inside the house. Upon entering the house, the Duke recognizes Lee, possibly from her past visits. Jade questions his father about meeting the girl. The Duke is surprised that Le has provided him with her card and suspects her of stealing it. The Duke states that he knows Le and feels an obligation to her. This leaves Jade even more perplexed. Jade, confused and surprised, cannot believe his father's words and looks back at Lee unhappily, trying to figure out what is going on. The girl asks the Duke if the maids have already been hired, expressing interest in the matter. The Duke does not immediately understand why she is asking such a question, causing him to misunderstand. The girl explains that she noticed an advertisement for servant recruitment in an article and suggests that she, since she has previously helped the Duke, might be given the opportunity. Despite her being only nine years old, Le claims that she is strong and healthy enough for her age and is willing to do any job. She claims to be able to limit herself to eating once a day and is willing to take on various chores such as scrubbing floors and doing laundry. Lee offers her services, demonstrating her determination and willingness to labor. The Duke and his son are confronted with the little girl's unexpected request. The little girl, due to her diminutiveness, can easily reach the chimney and have it cleaned. Suddenly, a girl named Marion enters the room and introduces herself as Cullen's little sister, causing surprise and questions. Marion inquires about the girl's parents, asking where they are. The girl responds by telling that she had a mom, but that she died a few years ago, revealing her difficult situation. Herzog's sister asks where the girl lives and gets the answer that she has no permanent home, leaving some mystery in the air. The girl replies that she has to live wherever she has to, with no permanent home, again emphasizing her precarious situation. The Duke finds out where Le sleeps, expressing concern and interest in her living conditions. Le's girl replies that she has to sleep outside, but claims that she tolerates everything with difficulty and the place where she sleeps is clean. Le claims that covering herself with a discarded blanket at night is enough for her, but her words are met with silence, reflecting a general sense of sadness. The Duke's younger sister, Marion, asks Le if she understood correctly that her brother Cullen had invited the girl in order to settle accounts with her. Le replies that there is much more to ask for and expresses surprise as to why she is to become a common maid, emphasizing her modesty. Le expresses her passion for change, saying that she wants to be different and does not wish to remain poor in the future. She expresses her desire to change her destiny so that she will no longer be humiliated and avoid the difficult conditions on the streets. Liz's goal is to achieve a normal life free from the constant humiliation and hardship she experiences on the street. Marion, Duke's younger sister, questions whether this is the main reason for Liz's arrival in their home. Liz's girl feels lost and does not know where to turn for help, expressing her need for support and understanding. Marion responds by supporting Lee, saying that she understands and emphasizes that the girl is very good, showing sympathy. The girl came carrying flowers in her hands, expressing her love and desire to make them feel good. 
The Duke, surprised by this gesture, asked where she got the flowers from, trying to understand their origin. The girl herself also found herself puzzled, not remembering how or where she got the flowers as she had them when she woke up. The girl's fear was lest the Duke think she had stolen the flowers and she tried to explain her situation. The girl said that she knew an older boy who sold flowers and her friends had probably left the flowers near her while she slept. The Duke's younger sister, Marion, proceeds to ask what kind of reward the girl wants, expressing concern and willingness to help her in her need. The girl, with touching modesty, says she is willing to accept as much as she is offered, or a quarter of what the adults receive. The Duke, full of curiosity, wants to clarify the circumstances and asks how she knows of his search for William. The girl tells him that she saw in an alley a man similar to the wanted criminal described in the posters. The Duke expresses his appreciation of her attentiveness and asks why, among many people, she turned to him. She replies that it was an accident, but the Duke cannot hide his surprise, not understanding why it was he who caught her attention. The girl explains that she could have turned to anyone in the crowd for help, but the Duke attracted her by his beauty, not knowing that she was facing a high-born aristocrat. The Duke, noticing that Le had learned of his direction to the train station, suddenly asked her about it, showing interest. The girl replied that a well-dressed man like the Duke would not run through dirty alleys, allowing her to guess his route. The Duke expresses admiration, calling her clever, which unexpectedly touches Le and brings her some recognition. Reasoning with Le, the Duke asks her to wait, explaining that he needs to discuss the girl's proposal with the family council. Lee, worried and unsure of her decision, hopes that her act was not a mistake and tears come to her eyes. The little girl would like to at least work in the stables rather than be a maid or a kitchen washer. The Duke's younger sister, Marion, feels sorry for the girl, Lee, and considers taking her under her wing. However, Jade expresses doubts that the child can be accepted as a pet. Her sister begins to object, suggesting the idea that Lee could go to a temple where she would be provided food and education. Jade raises a contradiction to this idea, arguing that she would become a nun, which does not fit with the family's plans. Marion turns to her son, asking if he plans to keep Lit in the house, hinting at the possibility of taking her into the family. The Duke expresses concerns about rumors if they take such a young child as a servant, emphasizing social obligations. Marion suggests the idea of fostering Lit into a family and raising her in this noble environment. Jade thinks the idea is a joke, but the Duke argues that it's not a joke. Duke recalls that the advertisement for workers was posted six months ago, and they have already taken in several maids. Girl Lee, feeling sad, discovers that her offer of employment has not been accepted. The Duke, expressing his concern, asks the girl if she is willing to obey all his instructions. The girl agrees, expressing her willingness to follow his instructions. The Duke promises her five gold coins weekly, which leaves her shocked as it seems like a huge sum to her. Lee is puzzled about the future, not knowing what she is to become, and is surprised when the Duke says he will adopt her. Lee's question about whether an adopted daughter is a type of servant elicits laughter from Marion, creating a touching moment. Little Lee is surprised that she will have her own servant, not realizing the full significance of what has happened. The news that she will be adopted brings additional surprise to the little girl's heart. Her sister, addressing her brother, points out the confusion, for he first speaks of money and then asks if she will be his daughter. The boy relays that the prince is waiting for the duke, causing unforeseen excitement in his ordinary life. The duke, busy with his own affairs, asks the boy to wait, showing indifference to the royal family. The girl, observing the scene, wonders how one can be so indifferent to the royal family, seeing it as a sign of the greatness of the Duke's family. The Duke announces to the girl that he cannot allow her to work because of her young age, but thoughtfully offers to let her live in his house. The Duke's decision surprises the girl when he orders her to become his daughter, opening the way to noble status for her. Becoming Cullen's daughter means entering the high society while becoming part of the famous Duke's family. The Duke, after asking if she agrees, offers her a unique chance to become part of his noble house. The girl's agreement, mixed with feelings of happiness and unhappiness, indicates an inner struggle before such a coup in her life. The Duke reminds her that such a chance comes only once in a lifetime, reinforcing its importance and value. The Duke makes a strong statement to instruct the butler accordingly, implementing the changes in the girl's life. 
The younger sister, stunned by this news, expresses her outrage, noting that the Duke does not even know her name. The Duke replies that there is no need to know her street name, as he is going to give her a new one, bringing warmth and care. At this point, La realizes that she still hasn't given her name and decides to share that her real name is Lee given by her mother. The Duke, showing consideration for her, shares that she was apparently born on a Monday, revealing his knowledge of the ancient meaning of Liz's name. Surprised by this news, La heads to the bathtub, where the Duke promises that a maid will soon arrive to help her bathe. The Duke adds that the butler's name is Shin, adding new family members and creating a warm atmosphere. The girl, immersed in her new reality, wonders to the Duke what will happen when she becomes the butler's adopted daughter. What follows is the girl's question about the reasons for welcoming her into the house. With incredible sincerity, she asks why the Duke brought an orphan and what she should do now. The Duke, answering as an adult, emphasizes that in aristocratic families, foster children are not unusual and sometimes even a charitable act. He reveals that sometimes families adopt children for the company of their own children, creating a special unity in the family circle. By joining an aristocratic family, Le will become an object of admiration, and the Duke's charity will be recognized and encouraged by society. The girl begins to dream of a future where she, having grown into a praiseworthy lady, will be able to give back and contribute to charity. In a dangerous world where the streets are full of murderers, Le, a young orphan, discovers that fate can be kind. Instead of fighting for survival, an opportunity is presented to not only avoid starvation, but also to get an education that cost her out of reach. Grateful for the charity, Le realizes that this is her chance at a new life full of care and opportunity. The butler, realizing his rudeness, apologizes and promises to take care of Le as a proper lady in this special family. It is noted that the Duke shows no loyalty to everyone, making concern for Le's health and well-being an important goal. Lee is approached by a butler named Shin whether she has sought refuge in the arms of the powerful magician who is her new guardian. Contrary to Liz's fears, she hopes for a peaceful and healthy life despite the Duke's past that has claimed the lives of many. Cullen, an unusual killer, pulls La out of her dangerous surroundings, becoming her new protector and guardian. Not only is he an assassin, but he is also the most powerful dark mage of the last 500 years, creating an aura of mystery and magic around him. In Duke Cullen's struggle to survive with dark energy, he has found a way to keep himself alive by drawing power from dark magic. The essence of his unusual power is mana absorption, in which he is enhanced by absorbing magical energy from the bodies of his victims. His family members, having inquired about his ability, decided to use him as a weapon against the dark forces. Born out of strange circumstances, Cullen becomes a unique tool in the hands of his family. His role in the family turns into a murderous assassin of assassins who personifies justice by using his dark power. This creates a villain who seeks to destroy other villains and becomes part of the royal family's strategy. Cullen Levelton, a special purpose weapon whose destiny is filled with dark energy and an eternal quest for justice. Le takes one look at this unique hero and realizes that despite his darkness and dark abilities, the desire for justice lives within him. In her eyes, he looks like a hero battling inner demons and a dark destiny. Frightening yet inspiring, Duke Cullen Levelton becomes a unique hero in his difficult fight for justice. There was a knock at the door. The sounds were a polite reminder that caring maids were at the door, ready to give her a gentle and peaceful welcome. The maids brought freshness and lightness into her life, offering moments of luxury in the form of a bath and massage. The dark water in the bath was a symbol that cleanliness and care were available to everyone, even those accustomed to difficult conditions. The soft cloth used for wiping enveloped her body with a caressing touch, reminding her that she was here now in a safe haven. She felt how good it felt to be groomed, radiant, like a strawberry in its prime. A miracle happened to her hair, it became shiny and of a natural shade, like the magic of grooming and transformation. The maids assured her that everything was ready, and she entered the renewed world like a queen. Before her stretched a majestic table set as at a real banquet, like a feast for the most important person. Madame felt care and attention surrounding her from all sides, like a gentle breeze carrying a blessing. This evening was the moment when warmth and care filled her soul, turning a difficult journey into an exquisite path of family comfort. She felt that all this magnificent table had been prepared exclusively for her, leaving her all alone. 
As she waited for someone to join her soon, she realized that this comfort and luxury was meant just for her. After 20 minutes of waiting, she couldn't bear to eat the meal that had been prepared with such care. It was not just a meal for her, but a restoration of her appetite, which had been lost through illness and in the transition to the new world. Contemplating this exquisite banquet brought tears of gratitude for her care and attention. The master, the owner of this wonderful place, noted her amazing appetite and realized it was not just food for the belly, but food for the soul. Jade suddenly appeared, finding herself witnessing her excitement and moment of weakness. Her heart filled with anxiety about how he would now look at her afterward, and she apologized for her independence. He gave her care and comfort and lifted her in his arms, settling her in her seat, realizing that what mattered most at this moment was not the food, but her well-being. Jade instructed the girl to take the seat across from him, creating a warm, caring atmosphere. The first thing that caught his eye was her blonde hair, which turned out to be an unusual strawberry shade. The question of why her hair smelled like strawberries came out of Jade's mouth in surprise. The girl, despite her younger status, actively participated in the shared treat, showing joy in the food and accepting it gratefully. Recalling her poor days on the block, she shares with Jade the rule of friends. Even a small piece of bread is shared among themselves, creating a unified community. This rule is not just a survival strategy, but a show of mutual aid that strengthens their bond. She tried to please her young master, but feared he would think ill of her because of her appetite. Jade, however, assured her that he observed her with interest and appreciated her moderation. Not only did he notice her habits, but he emphasized his admiration for her ability to handle so much food. Lee was surprised that her words didn't seem to reach Jade, creating some misunderstanding. Instead of discussing her issues, Jade invited her to eat more, expressing interest in watching her. His comparison of Lut to his former cat Popo gave the overall scene a light and caring tone. Popo was a glorious cat, eating giant portions and always restlessly carrying her food. Jade shared a story about his late pet, leaving a trace of nostalgia in the air. The girl expressed sympathy for the departed cat, showing her sensitivity to other people's losses. Jade suggested she look at Popo's stuffed animal, but Lick, feeling uneasy, declined. A fear stirred in her heart that the gentleman might use her for his experiments. The dinner scene turned into a marvelous moment of sharing stories and experiences, strengthening the bond between Lei and Jade. Lee is intrigued by the mystery of her death, and Jade shares with her the story of his attempts to save her. Jade, who was conducting environmental research, made every effort to change her fate, but the efforts were futile. Remembering Jade from the past, she sees him as a hidden but not bad man withdrawn in his world. Jade, surprised by Lee's interest in friendship, quizzes him, and she admits that he is the reason she stayed in this world. Jade states that the decision was made by his father, and his own confrontation would have gotten him kicked out of the house. A glimpse of the complex relationships in an aristocratic family emerges, where even noble acts can have conditions. At this point, Le sees Jade not only as a mysterious gentleman, but also as someone for whom one can feel gratitude and friendship. Lee argues that brother and sister cannot be friends, expressing his point of view. Jade, disagreeing with this statement, emphasizes that it does not prevent them from becoming closer, adding that he enjoys watching her eat. Lee, responding to his attention, explains that she's been eating unusually much today, going beyond her normal eating habits. Through a lively exchange of words, Jade wants to know more about her preferences, noticing the red flowers with gold stripes. Such a statement from Jade comes as a shock to the young lady. A question about the bad thing about adoption triggers dialogue that epitomizes the uncharted nature of the story. The serious facial expression adds to the mystery of the moment under discussion. Jade's intriguing question about the reasons for the adoption questions the Duke's motives hinting at the depth of the mysterious past. Liz's answer, not knowing the reasons, gives her the character of an enigmatic heroine with secrets. Jade, by throwing in a defiant question about possible murder, reveals a concern about Liz's past actions. Le claims she did not kill, creating an image of a girl with a pure heart. The boy's questioning of additional bad deeds brings to light a misunderstanding that has called into question the purity of her intentions. The story of the purse reveals the humanity and kindness of Leia, who strives to do good deeds even in difficult situations. The description of the punishment that Lee endured introduces elements of touching, highlighting her resilience and fortitude. 
The question about her father's role in the game clarifies that Lee is not just a toy, but has her own history and dignity. Once in this palace, Le felt her reality being questioned, perhaps she is just a toy for Cullen. An agonizing doubt crept into her mind. Was she even worth being in these exquisite surroundings? The question about the villain who had wronged her encouraged her to remember, but time had erased the memories. Promised to recreate the appearance of that villain in the form of a soft ball so that Le could play with it if she remembered. The girl hesitated, pondering whether to remember something that might hurt. She introduced herself Lee, nine years old, growing up in the dingy slums of Seton in Levelton. The only thing that existed most to her was her mother, who had passed away, plunging Lee into loneliness. Life in the back alleys had turned her into a small beggar, seeking mercy in the chaotic struggle. All available information indicated that Lee was not connected to the dark side, she was just a child without the support of a mother. Nothing seemed particularly suspicious about the story. The butler carefully relayed to the Lord all the details he had learned about Le's little heroine. The Lord was inquisitive, clarifying whether the butler was attracted to Le because of the rare flower or whether the decision had other roots. Yes, the butler replied, this flower is unique and its origins are surprising. He spoke of the red hippocampus with a golden pattern sent by the criminal who killed Le's mother as a symbol of defiance. The Lord asked the butler a question. Was Le trapped or was she colluding with the criminal? She is either a victim or perhaps she was inadvertently forced to become an accomplice, the Lord said, showing his wariness. Objecting, the butler emphasized that a nine-year-old child could not be a spy. The Lord cautioned him, she seems cute, but be careful. After all, your weaknesses include a love for children and animals. Shin, this could be used against us, the Lord warned, realizing that the butler's gentleness could become a vulnerability. He wondered what to do with the young Master Jade after the tragic loss of the chimera he was raising. This begged the question, why did the chair begin to move? The Lord was puzzled. Lord asked whether the remains of the thirty dead had been recovered and handed over to their families. In response to a suggestion that the killer be chopped into thirty pieces and distributed to the families, Lord said that would be punishment enough. The little girl's memories of her previous life mostly involve reading books in a white hospital room. Her memories reflect her childhood dreams, Mommy, I want to catch bad people when I grow up, can I? The girl, though physically weak, expressed her strength in her desire to become a protector of good. Of course, Aryuna is so intelligent, her heart is full of admiration for the elegant and powerful Levelton family. In her memory, Duke Levelton's family is only represented by blurred images, as if it were a distant past. Through the hazy memories comes the thought, that must have been the last book I read before my previous life. To Little Lee, all this reality seemed like a dream that brought some mysterious wisdom. She wondered why she had failed to memorize the plot of the daily life of the Duke of Lewelton's family. Waking up each day, she doubted what was going on around her and often thought that her previous life was just a dream. The words, Good morning, Jade, became a ritual that filled her days with light. Greeting the morning with Jade made her feel like it was the only important and real thing. Looks like the Duke isn't here today either, the mistress remarked, and Jade replied that her father was probably busy touring the estates. The thought of dark intrigue flashed through the girl's mind as she surveyed the estates and she decided not to ask again. Several morning breakfasts were spent in the pleasant company of Lit when every glance at her food turned into careful observation. Though the girl still found it difficult to understand, they grew closer once they exchanged names. Despite her desire to master table etiquette, there was no time to rush, and this issue was taking a back seat. She asked Jade if he was busy today and suggested they go to the academy, she needed an outlet. He gave her a balloon in return, suggesting she do something nice. This was something special to Le, as balloons were usually a reminder of the holidays. Wow, a balloon, she exclaimed, accepting it with surprise. Memories of her daddy giving her balloons in a past life came back to her when she was sad. Tears of joy glistened in her eyes when he noticed her emotion. In gentle words, he expressed his surprise at how much she enjoyed the balloon. The girl responded by expressing her gratitude for the gift and assured him that it would always be with her. He described the milk tea made from mountain tea leaves from the Rahul Empire, giving her an incredible aroma. A smile appeared on her face, and she noted that this tea created a wonderful start to the day. The moment was filled with incredible tenderness and warmth. 
Everything was so sweet that words of gratitude could not convey all the joy she felt. The family home of the Dukes, the oldest family in the empire, is filled with the history of many generations. This ensemble of buildings epitomizes not only the wealth but also the greatness of the Duke's family. The territory belonging to the family stretches across the expanse of the capital and becomes a testament to the times. The question of who now occupies these expanses was asked by Lit, sparking the clerk's interest. The ducal family used to inhabit all these houses, but now they are empty, leaving them in disrepair. The clerk cautioned her against visiting the temple where the duke's valuables were kept, warning her against recklessness. For Lee, the temple became a symbol of Duke Cullen's office, creating excitement and curiosity. The appearance of a carriage belonging to the temple raised questions and more mystery. Meeting the Lord's sister gave the day an unexpected twist. The rumors of the duke's adopted daughter being talked about all over the city turned out to be true. Contrary to the efforts to gather all the newspaper articles, the rumors about this mysterious girl spread like fire. An unbelievable encounter and fun adventures filled her day. Finding herself under the attention of Lady Rose, La felt an unexpected boost to her reputation. Meeting Lady Rose awakened La's interest in the past and a surge of memories. As Lady Rose noted her outfit, La realized that she had yet to adjust to her new reality. The artificial restriction on walking caused frustration, but the butler was undeterred. The conversation with Lady Rosa emphasized her inexperience in the world of high society. Lady Rosa invited Lee to go for a walk, but the butler reminded her of the need for the Duke's permission. Madame decided to postpone the formalities and simply go shopping for new clothes, taking Lee by the handle. Politely offering to call her Marion, Madame pointed out the necessity of selecting clothes from a woman's point of view. Avoiding a meeting with Cullen, she opted to go shopping, using her work at the station as an excuse. Leaving the house, the girl and the madam set off in a carriage on a marvelous journey through the picturesque countryside. Meeting a lovely lady who appreciated the beauty of Le left its marks in their souls. Noting the gift of recognizing talents, Madame Marion praised the girl, giving her a special significance. Madame apologized for the previous meeting, recounting the unwanted encroachments she had had to fend off. Talk of work at the temple left Little Lee with questions, while Madame anticipated new impressions of the dresses. The toy store turned out to be a clothing store where the ladies of the town chose their outfits, but it came as an unexpected surprise to Lee. Gradually growing closer to the Madams, the girl listened with interest to the stories of beauty and refinement of style. Savile's store provided them with a unique opportunity to choose for the gorgeous outfits for any occasion. Despite her young age, Le realized that she had a lot of mandatory events to attend. Gathering to buy many dresses, the girl and Madam embarked on an exciting journey of style and fashion. Madam, proud of her choice of clothes, admired the girl's lovely vision, leaving behind all previous worries. Walking through a store filled with fashionable clothes gave them both a sense of joy and bonding. She remembered her childhood when a toy store seemed like an unattainable luxury. Memories of the shopkeeper kicking them out mixed with the hope of feeling the dresses and feeling special. Despite the amazing outfits, Le couldn't escape the feeling that she lacked some childlike spontaneity. Despite the differences in their worlds, the outing to the store was not just a shopping trip for both of them, but a way for them to bond. Met with joy, Le and Madame Marion entered the store, where they were immediately greeted by the employees. After politely asking what kind of dress they wanted, the staff suggested a new Obelson silk for a future outfit. Madame Marion stated that the choice was not about her, but about the little girl who had become part of their family. The staff was surprised to learn of the new member of the Levelton family and began to consider options for the little guest. As they waited to see what the Levelton's budget had to offer, the store employees eagerly set about choosing silk. The little girl made an appreciative impression with her sweet and humble nature. Madame Marion was surprised to be asked about the Levelton family's budget and explained that they had their own funds. The surprised shopkeeper listened attentively about the coins and 100 gold pieces, expressing her willingness to help. Marion assured the girl that she need not worry and that this day was a special occasion for joy, not fear. In her heart, however, the girl harbored fears that she might be kicked out because of her spendthrift behavior despite Madame's soothing words. While the struggled with her inner anxiety, the store employees had already begun selecting clothes and sizes for her. Excitement and gratitude filled the little girl's heart as she watched them lovingly choose an outfit that fit her. Chapter 7 
When discussing a new outfit for Little Lee, Madame expressed her desire to choose something more refined and in keeping with the status of the Duke's family. Marion's grief darkened her soul when they brought old-fashioned outfits that did not conform to the latest trends. Seeing a dress in the catalog that won her heart, Marion offered to try it on, and they were directed to the fitting room for special guests. The attendant specified that the dress chosen was for special occasions and balls. At the moment of fitting, the entrance opened and the words, Hello, Lady Rose, filled the air. Remembering the mention of Lady Rose, Marion noticed her presence among the visitors. Trying to help with the situation, the little girl started to fold the dresses, but was stopped, assuring her that the maid could handle it. Lady Rose expressed her dissatisfaction that the Duke had taken the girl into foster care, stating that she had expected to become his consort. Doubting the girl's abilities and fearing that she might be like young Master Jade, Lady Rose began to reflect on rumors in social circles. There were difficulties in her upbringing, of which the maid had warned her. The Duke did not express his thoughts, and the maid advised that Libby married off and sent to the village. The lady contributed her opinion, emphasizing that Le must be beautiful to find a suitable groom. However, the Duke's tastes remained a mystery aside from his preference for women. Some speculated that Le, if she looked unusual, might be sold to the circus, causing alarm to the girl. To avoid unpleasant encounters, Le asked to leave the street, encountering those who saw her as nothing more than a beggar. The little girl encountered such people often, but she learned to ignore their disgust. Marion reassured Lee, telling her that it didn't matter now and that she would always be her support. Marion's admiration for the beauty of the Duke's younger sister began to brighten, especially in the new dress that emphasized her splendor. A co-worker had advised Marion to choose an outfit with a similar design, bringing their views on fashion closer together and giving new meaning to their relationship. Lee was thrilled to be able to wear paired outfits with Marion, seeing her happiness in this moment. The employee carefully sat the girl down to rest, offering her a drink while Marion, happily choosing an outfit, filled the air with their world of tenderness and understanding. The girl anxiously checked her balloon, but it was gone. Her heart pounded with worry. She screamed, calling for her mistress, realizing that the gift from Jade had been stolen. Suddenly, fear gripped her. Suddenly, a hand emerged from the darkness, offering to read her destiny. The voice assured her that knowing her destiny from childhood would help her through the difficulties ahead. The voice called insistently, claiming that a famous fortune teller resided here. For a small fee, only five silver coins, she could reveal her future. The girl refused, feeling she was not ready for that. The shadow disappeared, and she was left alone with her thoughts. Suddenly, a toy store opened in front of her, the place that had caught her attention. However, the lost balloon still occupied the center of her attention. She realized she was lost, surrounded by unfamiliar streets. Panic gripped her, fading into fear of the unknown. The girl realized that the dress she was wearing was not hers at all. She took it and walked away, leaving it behind without warning. Mixed feelings raged inside her. A desire to return quickly pierced her heart. She understood that home was her comfort and safety. Tears glimmered in her eyes, but she didn't give up. The girl was determined to find her way home, to regain her selfless joy, and to carefully tend to the balloon that might still be found. A sudden blow forced her to leave her feet, and she found herself on the ground. The realization that her dress was ruined found her at the most inopportune moment. Lost, and with no idea how to get back, she felt fear overwhelm her. Her tears were bitter weeping, and she felt so sorry for herself. Suddenly a bird appeared in front of her, as if sent to comfort her in her time of need. The sudden appearance of the Duke stunned her, and the question of how she had escaped sounded like magic that brought back hope. The Duke already knew she had headed for the dressing room, which made her search all the more meaningful. Saying she was looking for a gift for Jade, she justified her actions while Marion busied herself with choosing outfits. The girl shared a story about the balloon Jade had given her, promising never to lose it. Fate, however, resisted her intentions. The Duke reacted coldly, stating that she could just buy a new balloon, but her heart valued a promise beyond her reach to buy. She asked how the Duke had recognized her so quickly, since the last time he had seen her was in different clothes, soiled and without shelter. With this question sounded a note of hope for a change. The Duke recalled his encounter with Lee, describing her sparkle as a magical glow that caught his attention and how suddenly an angel appeared before him. 
In that moment, he saw something divine in her, and he couldn't resist admitting that she was a true angel, and that made her special. It was a pleasure for Lee to hear such words, and she felt embarrassed to see the tenderness and sincerity in Duke's eyes. Suddenly, a female employee appeared, anxiously recounting her fright and Le's disappearance, as well as her intention to call the police. Duke reassured the worried employee, explaining that Le had just gone out to look for the balloon and everything was fine now. The employee apologized for the loss of the balloon, blaming a guest who had ventilated the room, but the Duke rushed to comfort her, saying that everything was fine. Lady Rose suddenly appeared, showing her joy at seeing the Duke, and wondered who the girl was, looking at her with some displeasure. Chapter 8 The Duke's meeting with Lady Rose brought back memories of long ago, and he recognized that it had been a long time since he had seen her. The lady expressed her surprise at hearing rumors that the Duke had adopted the girl and expressed her desire to become friends, believing that they would soon become one big family. The girl, in response, remarked that Lady Rose was even more beautiful than she had realized. The Duke confirmed the lady's beauty by recalling their meeting at the restaurant, and although it was only a tea party, his attention was caught. The lady expressed her support for the Duke in his charitable endeavors and also asked if he needed a governess. Supporting her suggestion, she recommended an experienced teacher who could provide Liz education given the family's circumstances. The lady assured the Duke that the teacher would be willing to protect his charges and his help would keep the girl's origins a secret. The Duke, leaning toward Lee, turned personal and asked how she really perceived him. The girl, unexpectedly to the Duke, replied that he was a Duke to her. The Duke experienced a touching moment when he announced that he was, in fact, her father and asked her to call him by that name. The girl, feeling embarrassed, faced another request from the Duke. He asked her to ask Lady Rose to leave the room, creating a tense moment in the air. The lady heard this and did not hide her annoyance, turning to the Duke to ask what was going on. The Duke replied that it was difficult for her to understand the hidden messages looking her straight in the eye. He clearly and emphatically expressed his desire to rid himself of her presence and not see her around anymore. The Duke reasoned that he needed her to disappear from his vision, emphasizing that this was exactly what he desired. The lady was shocked by such rudeness, she had not expected such words from the Duke. The little princess did not approve of the Duke's character, but at the same time she admired the way he treated the lady. With parting words, the lady left the room, leaving behind a tense atmosphere. The Duke, praising the girl for her nobility, reminded her of how her sister maids taught her aristocratic manners. The lady took umbrage, pointing out that the girl did not have a proper understanding of her position. In response, the girl claims that her beauty does not compare to her interlocutor, which stuns Lady Rose. The little girl sincerely remarks that if she were as beautiful, she would have to marry early. This question about whether her looks could lead to a sale to the circus is thought-provoking. The lady, distressed by the overheard conversation, expresses her displeasure by comparing her to a stray cat. The Duke expresses his hope that she will be more careful in her treatment of his daughter and be responsible for her actions. The lady refuses to leave the place, not realizing that her request to leave was a clear sign. In response, the Duke reminds her that the street belongs to him and expresses his disappointment in her desire to get closer to the aristocracy. The Duke strokes the girl's head affectionately and explains that it is none of her business and she was allowed to be unaware of it. The lady, realizing her mistakes, begins to apologize to the Duke for what happened and good relations. The Duke explained that they'd only had a couple of dinners together and it was hard to talk about any kind of relationship. It did not occur to him that the lady might have such hopes. He expressed doubt about such thoughts, emphasizing that if he had such feelings, he might have thought that she was the one who had left him. The Duke asked if she was leaving while he summoned the guards, making it clear that such behavior would not go unnoticed. At this time, a little girl approached them, wondering what had happened to Lady Rose. After what happened, it is probably not easy for the Duke to get back in touch with Lady Rose. Marion suddenly appears and questions the Duke about when he showed up. Questions arise as to whether he has been with the little girl all this time. Lee turning to the Duke relates that Marion tried on a new dress but came out in an old one. The question arises as to why this happened. The scene is interrupted, Marion orders her to stop and expresses surprise that his insight gives her goosebumps. Marion tells her admiration for her brother but also expresses outrage that she is not allowed to go on dates. The Duke tries to explain that her profession involves special difficulties in this matter. 
The Duke wants Marion, his sister, to realize the problems that can arise from her preoccupation with dating. Marion is outraged, not understanding why she is not allowed to go on dates while her brother is considered a saint because of his profession. Marion asks her brother in surprise if he dates girls like Lady Rose. Her brother replied that he had already broken up with her. The news of the breakup caused Marion and the girl to laugh. They could not believe this sudden change in the Duke's attitude. The Duke inquired whether Marion had acquired everything she needed. Her answer was to look at the large mountain of sacks of clothes she had mentioned. The little girl expressed her joy that Marion had brought her here, but she was also reluctant for her to spend so much money. The Duke asked how many gold coins Marion had spent, and upon hearing the answer 100 coins joked, advising her to spend 200 coins next time. The girl was shocked by such an amount, but the Duke suggested that in the future they would pay in advance to have the best outfits prepared for them. Marion excitedly stated that it was her little brother, bringing a sparkling smile to her face. The girl, though grateful, argued that she was quite content with this dress, for she already had five similar ones at home. But Marion insisted that five was not enough to fill her closet and declared that she would not have enough clothes for the upcoming ball. In response, the little girl expressed her gratitude for the care and attention, not considering the upcoming event a serious problem. The Duke reassured the little girl, reminding her that guardians took care of such things. It shouldn't bother her. To the little girl, the idea of spending millions of gold coins on shopping out of a sense of duty was something unbelievable and unheard of. When the Duke learned that only 20 outfits had been chosen, he expressed his desire to see more. His interest knew no bounds. Not wanting to spend too many gold coins, the girl played the part of pretending to be bad. She skillfully deceived the Duke. The Duke, realizing that he would not convince her, agreed with her choice and asked her to remove the rest of her clothes. She, proving to be smarter, stopped his further purchases. Marion offered to let Le play with her aunt, but the Duke forbade her to watch the girl. It was important to him that Le not go out without permission. Marion left, demanding to be called simply Marion. She wanted Lee to respect her as a peer, not as a duchess. We ended up losing her chance to find a gift for Jade. She was confused, not knowing how to explain the situation to him. Suddenly, a girl came up to them, frightened, and asked for help. Her face expressed fear and anxiety. Suddenly, she fell unconscious, and with this no one knew what to do. The Duke, after checking her pulse, only stated her death, and was still left wondering what could have caused this outcome. Lee, surprised at the lack of visible injuries, speculated that a heart ailment was a possible cause. The Duke expressed amazement at how savvy little Lee had turned out to be. A policeman approached them, wondering if the Duke had witnessed her sudden unconsciousness and recognizing his name. The policeman apologized for his ignorance and warned that he would ask some questions soon. The dead girl was identified as Bennett Alime, the daughter of a seafood market vendor who had no chronic illnesses. The policeman apologized again for the disturbance and explained that the kingdom's capital had a high crime rate and suspicious deaths. Le began to doubt whether it was indeed a heart attack and expressed her desire to know the full extent of what had happened. The Duke turned to Le, reminding her how brave she had been when he had first seen her and asked what she was so afraid of. Le recalled the mysterious hand and shadow beckoning her to the unknown girl to reveal her fate. Le reassured the Duke that she was all right and reminded him that the most unpredictable events happen in life. The little girl said how it could be since she had no visible injuries. She suggested that it might be a heart attack. The Duke said there was that possibility. He was surprised at how clever Lei was after all. Then a policeman came up to them and asked Hersa if he had witnessed the girl fall unconscious. Then he asked his name. The policeman apologized for he did not recognize Hersa. Then said he would ask him some questions in due course. The dead girl's name was Benayalim. She had no chronic illness and the presumed cause of death was a heart attack. She was said to have been the daughter of a merchant who owned a couple of stalls at the seafood market. The policeman once again apologized to the Duke for taking up his valuable time. According to the book, the capital of the kingdom had the highest rate of crime, as well as suspicious deaths. Lo wondered if it really was a heart attack. It would be good to know the full contents of the novel. The Duke told the little girl that when he first saw her, she seemed very brave to him, but now she was frightened. He asked what she was so afraid of. I'll remember the hand and the shadow that beckoned her to the little girl to know her destiny.
Lowe reassured the Duke and told him that she was all right, that different things happen in the world. Butler meets Lay and Duke from the store and asks how he managed to arrive with the girl if they were in different places. He says he picked her up on the way. You came, father, said the son, but why the two of you? The Duke said something happened, that's why. Jake asked what happened. The little girl said she had lost his gift, a balloon. But in the end, she never found the balloon. I'm so sorry, the little girl said. He asked her not to cry over something that could easily be replaced. He asked if it was true that she liked him so much. He suggested that she go boating sometime. The girl liked the idea. Jay told her she was tired. He ordered her to rest until dinner and walked her to her room. The girl was so sweet, she immediately had a smile on her face. She's a wonder. I haven't noticed anything about La except that she's very nice, Herzog said. He reckoned that, as it were, she was unharmed. Cheyenne said that the lost girl was found immediately because they had sent their little friend, the snake. The Duke spoke of how difficult it was to raise a child. The little girl noticed a gramophone running on a magical stone. It was the first time she had ever seen a magical artifact. She asked Jade how old he was, to which the Duke's son said he was 14. She was surprised that the boy was 14 because she thought he was 17. She asked him how he could drink wine if he was underage. He told the little girl that it was okay because their family is careful about it. They drink alcohol and medicine very rarely in extreme cases. She wanted to drink too, but he stopped her, saying she was too young, half his age. She said she really wanted to grow up soon. A servant brought Jade a letter of some kind. When he opened it, he said, his majesty had sent a puzzle. The cause of death was a heart attack, and it was not the first time it had happened. In the case of a repeat incident, it could still be considered a coincidence, but on the third time it would be the police who would have to deal with it. Three women died in different places. The social status of the deceased women is different. The only thing they had in common was red hair. He hoped everything would go smoothly. The girl thought it was a good thing for Cullen, and he could go out hunting. She wanted to say something when suddenly something happened to her. It had happened to her before. It was Tuesday, August 9. Another victim was a poor orphan girl. A shadow approached her and told her that she had to make sure her mother was well in heaven. Unfortunately, the girl, who only got her name from her mother, was immediately tempted. The helpless little girl, who no one would look for, was treated very differently from other women. What a beautiful color of hair, something said, holding a saw in her hand. Those were the last words she heard before her left hand was cut off. The little girl began to be slapped to make her come to her senses. They asked if she was all right, and what was the date today? August 9, the little girl answered. She realized that today was the night. That was the day a poor orphan girl named Leia was killed. The Everyday Life of the Duke of Voulton's Family, Chapter 7. The Murder of the Fortune Teller. The story is as follows. From an early age, the outlaw grew up under the influence of his mother's strong obsession. He both loved and hated his mother at the same time, and amidst the cognitive dissonance, he suddenly realized that he wanted to be a mother himself. A mad obsession led him to women whose hair was the same color as hers. Pretending to be a fortune teller, he gave them a miracle drug for beauty, and though the temporary effects made the ladies' cheeks rosy and their skin improve, in reality it was a poison that would slowly and inevitably lead to a heart attack. A mad obsession led him to women whose hair was the same color as hers. Pretending to be a fortune teller, he gave them a miracle drug for beauty. And though the temporary effects made the ladies' cheeks rosy and their skin improve, in reality it was a poison that would slowly and inevitably lead to a heart attack. She gave the example, let's say they like to go to fortune tellers or something like that. The red hair was also an important clue, but the girl didn't want to talk directly about fortune tellers. The Duke didn't understand why she meant fortune-telling. Fortune-tellers usually came from poor families. She had heard there were many aristocrats among the people who went to famous fortune-tellers. Usually noble people go to places that suit their status, boutiques or restaurants. So the only place that comes to mind where everyone visits, regardless of origin, is fortune-tellers' houses. The Duke thought about it. He wondered about it and decided to check it out. The pain got worse and worse. The little girl couldn't take it anymore. The Duke asked Cheyenne to contact a certain information guild. La, come to your senses, they shouted. She was getting worse and worse. It was very painful. Better to kill me, she asked. The Duke held the paper in his hands, and he didn't understand. 
And this is all called the red hair fetish? Hersok asked. Who are you? The girl asked. Well, we'll have to chop you into little pieces, he said. He picked up the girl and took pity on her. He said he had to go to the hospital right away. The girl jumped up from the bed. They asked if she was okay. The girl thought she wasn't the only one involved. That night Cullen was to be pierced by an arrow, after which he slips into a coma. It was smeared with a potent poison. The kingdom summons eminent doctors and priests, but a month passes without Cullen regaining consciousness. As soon as word gets out, a crowd of people gathers outside the Duke's house. Most of them were indebted to the Duke's family. Some came to win the heart of the young heir, while others made plans to overthrow the Duke's family. I only know the future up to this point. The book closes and falls. This episode was the last thing the girl managed to read before she lost consciousness. The girl didn't understand why she was only now remembering such important things. She wasn't supposed to tell Cullen about the fortune teller. Jade grabbed her arm and asked if she came to her senses this time. The girl recognized her room. She didn't understand why everyone was looking at her. Everyone asked her how she was feeling. She said she was fine now. The butler told her that if she didn't feel well or if something was wrong, that she should say so right away. She understood that she was being watched the whole time. She did not know if she had said anything strange while she slept. The butler told Jade that Mistress was awake and he could go to bed now. He said that he had heard this some time ago. The girl was surprised that he had waited all this time for her to wake up. The maid came in and said that the results of the investigation they had asked to be notified of had come in. It was quicker than they expected. There was a report on the actions of the red-haired women. If it turned up, Colin would go to the fortune teller's house tonight. Duke, said the little girl. She thought that she couldn't let things come true, that everything happened just like in the book. She didn't know what to tell them. What was this world she had read about in a past life in a novel? She thought he wouldn't believe her words. With tears in her eyes, she asked him not to go. The place the girls visited was the home of a fortune teller called the Red-Haired Witch, which was in a slum. The Duke wondered if it was just as she had said. Such accurate information simply could not be accidental. He thought he was just being lured away. There were tears in the little girl's eyes. She couldn't quite say the phrase she wanted. She asked him not to go, but he didn't understand what had happened and asked her to calm down. She said she had a dream in which he was badly hurt. That's why she's very worried, because her dreams really do come true. She asked if he could stay with her just for tonight. She said she wasn't lying, but everyone was silent. She thought they were mad. The Duke said that he would stay at the manor tonight, and that the little girl's emotional stability came first. She asked if he was angry. He simply said he wasn't angry. She asked if he would chase her away. He didn't understand the reason for such a question. Jay tried to comfort the little girl, who was choking back tears, but she cried further. The Duke asked Cheyenne to bring her a sedative. She begged forgiveness for it. Though she calmed down, the tears still wouldn't stop pouring. Cheyenne ordered her to take the medicine quickly. She stopped him, telling him that she was already fine and that she would be fine if the Duke stayed by her side. But he insisted on his own. Jade said, but that if her stomach turns out to be ruined, she'll have to have surgery. Do you think she should? He asked. She didn't want to be on the operating table again in her new life, so she took the medicine. She was praised for it. The Duke asked if she could sleep alone tonight. She said no, tonight she sleeps next to the Duke. He said there wasn't even a drop of her blood in her, just amazing. Were her sweet actions a threat? Jade says he thought of that too. He couldn't believe his ears because it couldn't be were their thoughts the same. What was the atmosphere? He told her to lie down because that would make her heal faster. She said she wasn't even the slightest bit sleepy. She had been asleep for so long. How could she sleep now? She thought she would not rest until this night was over. The girl saw the sweet Duke beckoning her to the bed. She said she would not sleep but would just lie next to him. The Duke called the Duke to him and ordered him to lie down beside them. The butler said he would be nearby and if they needed anything they should ring the bell and he himself left. She thought that in this position they were like family, but what was the position of the adopted daughter? Wasn't she allowed at least a little bit of the idea that they were a real family? She suddenly felt sleepy, even though she had been awake a few minutes before. Jade said it was normal, since she had taken her medicine. She asked Hersog if he would leave. She asked him not to go, just in case she fell asleep. He promised. 
She thought in her mind that she would report everything to the police early tomorrow morning. If they caught the perpetrator, Cullen, before she could think about it, she suddenly fell asleep. When she woke up, the Duke was no longer there. She became very anxious. Early in the morning, Hersa was already in a hurry. He understood that Jade liked this child, but he was also very interested in this sweet girl. He said she wanted to tell him important information, even cried for him not to leave, and there was no mystery here. He said he'd just go there, and then he'd find out if it was a trap or not. If anything happens to me, that kid, the red flower is a spy sent by that guy. Hmm. I thought it would be a secret, he said. You're absolutely right, as always, Duke, said the butler. The Duke only laughed at that. Well, let the hunt begin, said the Duke. Our little princess woke up in the early morning hours and suddenly noticed that the Duke was gone. Before she could think of Cullen, he was gone. She wanted to report him to the police before he woke up, but it was too late. Cullen was already gone. She noticed the letter from him. She immediately rushed to Jade, who was fast asleep. She woke him up, but Jade didn't know what was going on. Jade told the girl that he had warned her that he would leave. The Duke told Jade that he had something to figure out. The girl thought, how could that obnoxious Duke listen to me quietly? She regretted falling asleep. She asked Jade if he could ride a horse. She asked him one request. Jade said that of course he knows how to ride, but what does she want to ask? She asked him to trust her just once. In return, she would not remain indebted to him. And he agreed. He called her into the stable. The girl saw a big and beautiful horse. She wondered if all horses were that big. Jade helped her onto the horse, and they rode off in search of adventure. He asked the little girl if everything was all right. He was a caring little boy. The little girl pointed to the alley and said it was there. They immediately rushed to the fortune teller's house. The girl wondered, had she really come here to find her father? Jade wondered if the little girl would just give up on him, and he doubted that his father would be there. The little girl heard some sounds and asked where they were coming from. She said she had a bad feeling about it and needed to check it out right away. But he grabbed her by the arm and held her back. He asked if she knew anything. She said he had promised her, and now he was stopping her. She asked him to just help her without asking any questions. He let go of her hand and said he wouldn't do it again. She wanted to know if Cullen was hurt, so she started listening at the door. After that, some guy came out with a gun. He was standing right at their backs. Suddenly, it was so quiet that the girl didn't know what to think. If she was not mistaken, either someone was hiding in the room or the fortune teller had accomplices. She asked Jade to run away if anyone happened to be near the door, though she thought he was stronger than a normal adult, so he'd be fine. He said he would comply with the request. The girl was scared, but she certainly didn't want Cullen to get hurt. I can't show you some footage from this scene as it contains possibly inappropriate content, so just listen. Thank you for your understanding. When they entered the house, they saw the Duke strangling this witch. When he saw his son and baby girl, he asked what was even going on here. The Duke ordered Jade to take the baby girl and leave. He said he was too busy right now, and they would talk later. Jay called the little girl to him, saying that such a sight was not for children's eyes. She began to lash out, saying that she had asked him not to interfere. Jade said no one was here, but Liv didn't think so. She caught very differently, as if she could sense someone near her. She didn't know when the arrow was supposed to fly at the Duke or from where. Then she noticed the arrow trap, and now she understood everything. It really was an arrow trap. She shouted to the Duke that he must not stay here but he did not hear her. Jade asked her to stay away. She rushed to her father, who had adopted her, and then an arrow flew out. It flew straight at the Duke, but Leigh covered him with her body and got the arrow herself. The Duke rushed to her. He could not believe his eyes. She was losing consciousness. They asked her to wake up. The Duke told her that she must not lose consciousness, for she was a good girl. He asked her to look at him. She said her shoulder hurt. They shouted to her in one voice that everything would soon be all right. The little girl remembered her past life. The doctors said everything was fine and that everything would be all right, Yuna. Her memories before she was sent to the operating room. 
Daddy, this is the girl speaking. I'm so sorry. And then the girl passes out. Butler goes out to meet the boys, apologizes for being late, when suddenly he sees the little girl lying in Duke's arms and his son who are trying to save the little girl. He asks what happened, not understanding what is happening. Cullen's father didn't like him, mocking him and calling him unacceptable words. You're a monster, he said, a cursed figment of our kind. Cullen's father, an ancestor of the Duke of Levelton, was jealous of his son's magical abilities, which were many times greater than his own. He was both envious of the boy and afraid of him. Did I summon a demon with whom I had no contract? He asked, and only a mother loved her son. When little Cullen shrank under the onslaught of blows like a trapped animal, his mother heroically covered him with her body. It's all right, Cullen mom's here, she said, and I will always love you. I'm sorry your mother is so weak, Cullen's mother said, so sometimes she had to take the blows for herself. The day she died, it was as if his world had collapsed, just like today. A beggar girl named Le, he only adopted her out of a passing whim. So why did she save his life? Why did this girl sacrifice herself? She even saw the Duke kill, and yet she didn't hate him, mistress. They called to her, but she wouldn't wake up. The Duke turned to Cheyenne and asked him to take the witch away, and Jade said he had to stop the bleeding. He told him to put something between her teeth so she wouldn't accidentally bite her tongue from the sudden pain. The Duke said the bleeding had stopped. He said he had to get the baby to a safe place first. Cheyenne said there must be a ducal family hotel nearby, so he went there immediately. They put her on the bed. The Duke went into the baby's room to check on her. He asked the doctor how she was feeling. The doctor said that her life was not in danger, but the details would be known only after the surgeon arrived. Thank God the arrow was not poisoned and missed her heart. The Duke said that if the girl dies, he is ready to destroy all the doctors in this city. He promised to do everything in his power to make her come to her senses, laugh, and be happy. Of the two probabilities, he was leaning toward one. Either she's a red flower and that guy's target, or she's a spy. If the information he had received last night was so precise and not a trap, then it was all a simple fall, he thought. But he could not imagine such an outcome. To shield himself from an arrow, even if it is a trap, the Duke had a great desire to care for her. He asked her, who is she really? Survive first, little one, you must take responsibility for your words since you called me daddy. So now a parent-child bond has been established between us. But the girl still didn't hear him. He no longer cared, even if she was covering for the other man. After all, he would take you away and make you his daughter. He promised himself, when the little girl woke up, to change his plan for her upbringing. He needed to raise her to be an arrogant and selfish girl who would not care, even if an arrow pierced him right in front of her eyes. Perhaps he wanted to keep her in this room first. He thought she would be more comfortable that way. Hurry up and wake up, he pleaded with her. Cheyenne entered the room. He asked the Duke how was the lady's health? The Duke replied that he had been told that her life was no longer in danger. Then he asked what about Jade? The Duke replied that he had been patient at first. Apparently, he wanted to wait until the operation was over. Now he's resting in his room. This is the first time I've ever seen a young gentleman in such an unstable condition, replied Davertsky. Tell me about it, said the Duke, pouring wine into a glass. It looked even ridiculous to me. After all, he was in the same unstable state too. He asked him if the temple had sent a man out yet. Cheyenne said that high-class priests have magic that can dispel suffering. He has contacted them, but there is a temple festival in the kingdom today, so most of the high-class priests are there now. As soon as the event is over, they'll send us a man, he said. Now listen to me carefully, said the duke to the butler, and tell the king exactly what I said. If he does not send all the priests here immediately, the duke will personally go to the royal palace, and the first royal offspring he sees will go through the same suffering as his daughter. Jade saw this baby, and I stated that this cat looked unusual. The duke said it was an unusual cat, but a chimera. A chimera is a magical creature that shares a life with its partner. One party suffers or loses life, and so will his partner. As of today, Jane is now the master of this baby. 
The Duke has told him to treat him as his other self and to take good care of him. Everything seemed like a brazen lie. When Lee is sick, she looks even more like Popo, but the resemblance wasn't that strong. Still, she was a little different. He wanted to see her smile again. He had done something he could never have imagined. He punished himself for not believing her. He didn't understand why she had sacrificed her life for her father. He had a very strange feeling. His heart began to ache. Suddenly, there were incomprehensible voices. Wake up, please. I want to see your face. I don't know who will be chosen, but let's not reproach each other because of this. Someone said. Suddenly, the little girl woke up. She didn't understand where she was and what those sounds were all around her. She remembered that she had saved Cullen and an arrow had stuck in her. The voice was gone. She thought, is she really dead again? Does that mean she's in the other world? Everything seemed like a brazen lie. When Lee is sick, she looks even more like Popo, but the resemblance wasn't that strong. Still, she was a little different. He wanted to see her smile again. He had done something he could never have imagined. He punished himself for not believing her. He didn't understand why she had sacrificed her life for her father. He had a very strange feeling. His heart began to ache. Suddenly, there were incomprehensible voices. Wake up, please. I want to see your face. I don't know who will be chosen, but let's not reproach each other because of this. Someone said. Suddenly, the little girl woke up. She didn't understand where she was and what those sounds were all around her. She remembered that she had saved Cullen and an arrow had stuck in her. The voice was gone. She thought, is she really dead again? Does that mean she's in the other world? She asked where they were now. Jade told her they were in the hospital. She asked where the Duke was now. Jade told the little girl that Hursug was safe. He told her that she had been unconscious for a week. The little girl was shocked by this news. Jade opened the curtain and turned to the doctors, telling them that the baby was awake. They couldn't believe their ears. They began to cry. Jade didn't understand the doctor's reaction, thinking that they had made such a scene to surprise him. The doctor asked Jade how long he had been here. Jade told him that he didn't need to know. The little girl wondered if Jade had snuck in secretly so he wouldn't be seen. She asked Jade who were the people in front of them. He told her they were her doctors. Jade said that after examining her arrow-pierced shoulder, they said she was perfectly safe and would soon regain consciousness. At first, there was no poison on the arrow, but later it was discovered that there was a drug on it. This drug is difficult to detect, so they didn't notice it right away. Even a small dose of the drug is critical to a little girl. She said all she could say to that was that she was just lucky. Jade responded by telling the little girl that she had been hit by an arrow, and how could she talk about it so easily, that only luck saved her life. The little girl told Jade that if the drug had hit her harder, she would never have woken up at all. In response, he said, could it be considered luck or just positive thinking? He said it was just a miracle. Then the little girl asked why the doctors were so happy. She had heard them say that they were now survivors. Jade asked her if she knew about her father's willful nature. He told the little girl that when she had been lying unconscious for about a week, her father had become very angry. The Duke was pacing from side to side in the corridor like a madman. He said he hated it when someone sacrificed themselves for him. He said if anything happened to the little girl, he'd take it out on the first person he saw. That's what he said. The little girl thought about it. She knew it was strange, but if you interpret his words in a positive way, it meant that he was worried about her. Jade said that eventually, at the end of their conversation, her father said that if the little girl did not wake up today, he would draw lots, and choosing one victim among the worthless doctors would punish her as an example to the others. The little girl realized that the punishment was murder. It's not like the doctor is some kind of sinner. The little girl asked Jade, aren't these people doctors? He said they were doctors, that there were seven of the most famous doctors in the capital in front of her. They were invited the day after she was hurt. The little girl thought they had not been invited, but kidnapped. It was the royal family who helped bring them all together. Baby was amazed at the extent to which this country revolves around the Duke family. The doctors came up to the mistress and asked if they could give the mistress a medical examination. Jade approved it. The doctor listened to her and said she would be fine. The doctor said that the little one's shoulder should be given full rest. He would come to check on her again this afternoon. Jade threatened to ask the doctor if he was lying this time. The doctor said he wasn't lying and that it was the plain truth. The doctors began to bow before the young lady. They said she was the luckiest person in the kingdom. They don't know what would have happened if something had gone wrong. The girl didn't know what they were talking about or to what degree she was lucky. Jade told the doctors that they were lucky that he had already made the draw, but this time they were forgiven. They were very happy and thanked him. Jade said the doctors were free to go. Alone ordered them to wait a little while until they got permission from their father, and only then could they return to their homes. 
The little girl asked to know what had happened. She wanted to know what had happened while she was unconscious and why she was called Lucky. She couldn't take it anymore. She wanted to know everything. Jay began her story of the fortune teller's house where several traps had been set and she had fallen into one of them. It turned out to be a crossbow device. If the fortune teller turns the ring on her finger to the right, an arrow will shoot out, which is lubricated with deadly poison. If she turns her ring to the left, a drug arrow will fly. While the father was strangling the man, he started the device. If he had turned the ring to the right, the poison arrow would have gone off and the baby would have died. The little girl was shocked by these words. In the piece, the arrow that hit Cullen was definitely poisoned. Jake explained to her the perpetrator's motive. The man whose mother suffered a perverse obsession with her son pretended to be a fortune teller and killed women with red hair just like the mother's. The content remained exactly as she remembered it. But this scumbag is a polemical scum. The drugged arrow he called for women. What a shame he died so quickly. The little girl felt sick to her stomach at this story. Sick at the mere thought of the criminals of this world. She was terrified. Jade reassured her. He said he was all right now. His father had given him a good punishment. She asked if he had killed him, but Jade didn't answer that question. He asked if she was in pain. The girl said she felt fine. The wound didn't seem to be very deep. At first she thought she was going to die, but on her shoulder she had lost an entire piece of flesh and there was even bone visible. And from the fracture and excessive bleeding, she could have died altogether. She had hoped that she was already recovered after all. Jade told her not to worry. The priest had used magic to relieve her pain for a week, so she might be in pain for a while. Now they were waiting for her in the next room. She had heard that magic-wielding priests were immensely valuable. Jade repeated that she didn't have to worry about it. Yes, if you could squeeze the life force out of priests, the main thing was that it would ease her suffering. The girl apologized for causing them so much trouble. Jade said her aunt was a saint, so why bother? But since she cared, he said she could repay her debt later with a donation. And then the girl realized how the world of rich people works. This, she thought, was the mindset of villains. Jade told her that he had many more questions for her. But first he wanted to ask why she had done such a stupid thing. If the drugged arrow had hit her father, nothing bad would have happened, so why had she taken the hit herself? She said that even though it was an ordinary drug arrow, if it had hit her heart, something terrible would have happened. But thanks to the girl's action, everyone survived. Jade called the little girl incredible. Despite being so young, no one could compare to her bravery. She said she wasn't that kind of person at all. She just wanted the Duke to get hurt, and Jade and Cheyenne were sad about it later. Jade laughed at that and said she was sweetly deceiving, covering her false speeches with flattery. The little girl liked those words. She knew that Cullen and Jade were not exactly ordinary people, so it was okay not to try to understand them. Jake apologized for not believing her. He should have listened to the little girl from the beginning. The baby was surprised by these words of his. Had the little girl forgotten whether she had said anything in her own defense when she had run into the criminal's lair? She wanted to excuse herself by saying that she had read it in a work. So far, however, Jay hasn't questioned her, and she's been quiet. The girl interrupted Jade's questioning by saying that she was hungry and wanted to sleep. He said, all right, he'll tell her to get something to eat. She ate and said she was now revived. But where is the Duke? The girl wondered. Jade said he had gone home for a while, and he would send a man for him. The girl said she was all right, and there was no need to call the Duke. You shouldn't intentionally make an appointment with him, she said. She hadn't come up with an excuse yet. She had also seen Cullen kill. She was terrified to imagine what he might do to silence her forever. She said she'd be glad if Duke came, but he was so busy right now. Everything will be all right, even if he can't visit her, said the little girl to Jade. Do you really think your father has never visited you? He said. She thought he didn't come at all. Jade said he came to see her every day, and now he just stepped away for a while. The little girl was surprised at this fact. If he was visiting her every day, then he wasn't that angry either, she thought. Jade said they would talk about what had happened when her father arrived. She wondered what to tell her father and how to get out of it. She was making her own cunning plan. She had the option of saying he had forgotten everything because of the traumatic shock. She didn't know if that plan would work. She kept thinking and wondering. In front of us is a picture of the Duke looking at a big pile of red flowers and asking the butler what it is. He asks what are the policemen even doing? It was like that while he was away from the scene of the incident for a while. And then suddenly he wondered. Cheyenne called the police, said the Duke. There's a dead body here. Upon investigation, they found out that this child was a boy who was selling flowers on the street. The Duke asked if this had anything to do with the fortune teller. 
According to the children's testimony, this boy told various ladies about a certain medicine and thus attracted customers. That is to say, he was an accomplice of the fortune teller. The Duke had heard a similar story recently about a boy who sold flowers. Also, we do not yet know who sent these flowers and for what purpose. Even if this was done to hide the corpse, there are still too many flowers in the room. Are the children you testified not orphans living in the alleys? Asked the Duke angrily, and they were these children. Often they shared the remaining flowers among themselves. On the first day, Lit told Hersog that someone had given her these flowers. Suddenly the Duke rushed to the carriage and ordered that the little girl be checked immediately. And Lay sat and wondered what to say to the Duke, to tell the truth or to lie. What if he wouldn't believe her? Suddenly the Duke walks in, anger or something similar on his face. The little girl became afraid of what he would say to her. Her father went over to her and hugged her tightly, telling her that her father was already here. He apologized for being so late, he just had some urgent business. He was glad she was alive, he was very worried about her. Before, when she was still living on the street, sickness was always her sole concern. Starving day after day, the little girl suffered all alone. Of course, she had friends, but she could only count on herself when she was sick. And only now did she understand how people feel when they worry about them. She thought she shouldn't get used to that feeling, because what would she do later if she had to leave here? She wondered. She asked her father if he wanted to ask her something. After all, she had secretly run away from him at night. He said he would, but first, he asked if she knew anything about the flower. He showed her the flower, the one she brought to the Duke at the beginning of the manwa. She said it was very beautiful, but she didn't know anything else. Well, that's all right then, I'm sorry, he told the little girl. He said he had many things to tell her. First of all, thank you for saving me. Really don't do that next time. He said fathers are supposed to protect their children, not the other way around. He asked her never to sacrifice herself for him. Not just for him, but for anyone else. She promised she wouldn't do it again. She didn't know what it was, worry for her or something else. He asked her why she looked numb. She had regained consciousness, though, and he was told that her life was no longer in danger. Have these inept charlatans lied to me again? Herzog asked. No, she said she was just relieved. Now Herzog suddenly asked if she wanted to ask him something. In fact, the girl thought it was the opposite of Colin wanting to ask her something. He asked if she wondered what he was doing there and who he had killed. She said she had no idea, but that guy was clearly a villain. She knew the Duke wouldn't attack an innocent man. Colin doesn't kill or even touch a man unless he commits an unforgettable sin. That is Colin's immutable rule. She didn't understand his reaction. She thought she had said something wrong. He asked her, where did you come from so interesting? He asked the little girl if she was afraid of him. She said she was afraid, but she wouldn't scream and run away, it was obvious. He said it was okay, and he was only interested in one thing. According to Jade, when she woke up, she immediately asked him to take the baby to the fortune teller's house. He asked how on earth did she know he was there. He said he wasn't going to pressure her, just wanted to talk. She replied that she had seen the leaves Duke had left in her room, she didn't know the reason, but it was the plain truth. That night, Colin left the documents with the important clues in the little girl's room and left. Colin wondered, for such a situation was unforeseeable. How could the impeccable Colin have left the case papers and just left? He remembered that there was a report on the actions of the red-haired women. However, can you read? He asked. She said she couldn't read, but she memorized all the signs around the street where she lived. That night the scene was a house called the Red-Haired Witch's House, which was two corners down from her street. He was shocked to learn that she knew the place. She said that a tall and dark fortune teller lived there. It was rumored that he ate children to maintain his power. Also, the little girl noticed the repeated writings on the leaf that she had often seen. And as she said, the fortune teller's house turned out to be the place that these girls visited. So as soon as she thought that the Duke might be headed there because of her words, she felt abruptly ill and had trouble breathing. So she woke Jade up and asked him to go with her. It is impossible to believe such a thing, and not because the Duke doesn't trust her, but because this story is like a miracle. It turns out that from this information, the child drew his conclusions, and she even remembered to include the investigative report she guessed, Herzog said. He said well, and asked her not to do it again next time. She approved of his words. From now on, she would try to listen to the Duke and always ask his opinion first. The butler said that the little girl was not only over-intelligent, but that she was also a very sensitive child. It was some kind of misunderstanding, but I'll leave it at that for now, the little girl thought. What is that flower? 
The first time the little girl brought it into the mansion, the Duke had exactly the same surprised face, and now he's holding it in his hands again. Noriki asked what kind of flower was the Duke holding in his hands, the girl's face, which became strange after each time the Duke looked at it. The Duke said that this flower was left to him by a bad man, too bad. The girl asked again, was he really that bad? He said he couldn't say for sure, since he didn't know who he was. Cullen briefly explained everything. Like clues to a clue, someone left red flowers at the scene of the crimes. However, Cullen still knew nothing about the identity of that person. The girl wondered who might have left those flowers. It turns out, the reason I was adopted by Cullen was not just luck. He adopted me because she brought those flowers, the girl thought. But she really didn't know anything about those flowers. She thought maybe Cullen suspected her of something. She didn't know what else to expect, and what else didn't she know? She wondered what would happen to her now. After all, she had already become so attached to Cullen and Jade. But as it turned out, the little girl knew absolutely nothing. She knew that this was out of the question in the work. The Duke called the little girl unusually savvy for her age, and so at first he did suspect her and thought she knew something. But he noticed and approved of her helping him whenever difficulties arose. She asked the Duke if he still suspected her or not anymore. He said he was fine now, and now she was his savior. Even through the fact that he finds her suspicious, it doesn't matter anymore. Does anyone else in this world have the same unique father-daughter relationship? He asked. The little girl was thrown into a stupor by this question. She was pleased. The Duke told her it was okay now. That day Cullen told the little girl a long story. He told her that his job was to punish bad people. The police couldn't handle people like that. The little girl knew at once that Cullen had told her his secret. She never thought he would tell her everything. He said she had helped him a lot this time. And though only Cheyenne and Jade knew about it, now she, as her daughter, had every right to. He asked her how she felt at this moment. He added that she is now a full-fledged daughter of this house. And since she had even learned his secret, there was definitely no going back. She promised her father she would keep his secret. She would take it with her to her grave. Nevertheless, the Duke wanted to ask the little girl one last question. He asked why doesn't she call him daddy? What is it, he asked. After all, the little girl had called him daddy before. Daddy, she said. Great, said Cullen, now try to call me daddy. She asked her father, where is Jade now? The Duke explained to the little girl that he was asleep in the next room now, for he hadn't slept a wink last night and had been by her side the whole time. The Duke asked Cheyenne to get Jade, and he left. Cullen took the baby in his arms and they walked. There was a bright smile on her face. The baby was surprised when she saw the balloons. Jay, are they really all mine? She asked him. She was so happy to receive them. The little girl really liked the balloons. He asked if she wanted to stop by the toy store. Baby didn't understand what had gotten into him. She thought she was being treated this way because she was sick. Duke said he had seen the way she had looked at that store the last time. He said that she was very nice when she looked in the window. She remembered that while she was out looking for a balloon, she stopped to look at these toys from afar. She was shocked that he remembered it. When there was a festival on the streets, she saw parents and their child walk into a toy store. This world was so different from hers that the little girl couldn't even be jealous. If Colin were in a good mood and had a free day, they could go there. Colin said they could go to the toy store anytime she wanted. She said she'd stop by sometime because she was embarrassed. She didn't want to spend the money. Afterwards, Cullen said he didn't know what she liked, so he decided to buy the whole store. The little girl was just really shocked at these words. She asked, why did he buy the whole store? She did not understand the act. She asked Cheyenne if it was true what the Duke said. Shane told the little girl that he tried to stop Herzog, but the owner. And after these words, Herzog asked Sheehan to shut up. He told him not to talk nonsense. Cheyenne said that the day before yesterday, the master had gone to the toy store to buy a present to give to the mistress when she woke up. But he became uncomfortable, for he did not know what to choose. She asked him if he really bought the whole store. The Duke said that he had only put down a down payment. That was enough money to buy up absolutely the entire store. He justified his action by saying that he didn't know what she would like, so he bought the whole store. Especially since he had never bought toys as gifts before, the girl wondered and asked Herzog, didn't he buy Jade presents? He said that once he bought him a present because Marion had molested him. It was a teddy bear in the shape of a soldier. He remembered Jade saying that he didn't need to be treated the same as other children. Signs of attention were not important to him. Having a rational father-son relationship was enough for him. That was far more important to him than any gifts. He said since they brought it up, let's avoid such awkward situations for each other instead of birthday gifts. It was the butler who picked out his gifts anyway. Shane asked Jade if he guessed everything. 
He said he had guessed long ago when every year he was given such useless gifts. Father could not have chosen such tasteless things, Jade said. After these words, Hersug asked what was his opinion of him anyway? After all, Hersug had allowed Jade into the scarecrow room, had even bought the poisonous snake he wanted, even though it was already dead. The little girl wondered why their relationship was so cold. Moreover, she learned that Cullen had never bought Jade a present for his birthday until today. This shocked the little child. Shin said that the host was completely inexperienced in terms of choosing gifts for children. If there is a stuffed brown bear that Duke caught, then why do we need a little bear at all? Hersug wondered. The girl realized that Cullen had never received gifts from his parents. He certainly wasn't spoiled, she thought. The little girl told Hersug that in case he had nightmares, the bear could chase away scary ghosts. Hersug called this a simple superstition. Well, it can't be helped, she said. She allowed him to come to her room when he was scared. And she allowed him to give her a hug in gratitude. She understood that Duke didn't have Mishka. After this suggestion, everyone looked in her direction. The Duke stroked the little girl on the head. He said he wanted to bite her. It was written on his face that he thinks she is so cute, and he can't help himself. Father, said the little girl, of course I understand your feelings, but you better not say that. Shane asked the mistress what she wished for. He said she was not allowed outside until she was well, so he would bring toys and whatever she wanted from the store. She asked if they could take the merchandise they bought back to the store. Duke said when she grew up he would give it back to her. She said she didn't need the toy store. She would also be happy with one doll that Hersa would choose for her personally. He asked her to repeat the words again for her, beginning with the words about the doll. She repeated, saying that she would be happy with one doll too, which the Duke would choose for her personally. He was sorry she was calling him Duke and not Daddy again. He said he would buy her the best doll. And the store was sure to pay him back, the girl hoped. The little girl was lying on the bed, bored. Cheyenne reminded the little girl that her safety was paramount. She should have been on bed rest before both the priests and the doctors arrived. She said she didn't have any pain. She asked if it was true that she was on the verge of life and death. She felt no pain thanks to the magic of the priests. She understood that it was precisely because she was lying down all the time that made her sick. She should have warmed up a little. She began to stretch, but it was very difficult. She felt that her body was very heavy. She looked at the moon, which was very beautiful. By the way, today is Minos Day, she remembered. At this time, it reaches its largest size. The little girl thought that she could hardly be useful in the future, for she knew the contents of the book only up to that point. She wondered who was the baddest person according to Cullen. The book only described how superbly Cullen had handled the incident, but she had a bad feeling about the man who sent the red flowers. Oh yeah, there was one other minor detail. The perpetrator had used a rare, tasteless, odorless poison in the case. But how could an ordinary poor country boy get his hands on something like that? Did Cullen think about it? Surely the little girl had had such thoughts before. What if I had a daddy? Yes, it was very lonely on her own. She couldn't even dream of having a family of her own. However, it's also scary when too much good stuff happens in the blink of an eye. What if things go badly when the baby starts calling Cullen daddy? What if he gets tired of her? What if he tells her to leave because she's useless? She thought. These sad and sorrowful thoughts never left her mind. She turned to Mistress Moon. She did not want to be too greedy, and so she asked only to see to it that she stayed in this house. We are shown an image of someone. This image tells us that he dealt with the guy who was selling flowers. He put his corpse in a prominent place. The fortune teller's partner could have gotten in our way, right? Asked this image to the guy with the hood on his head. He said that giving poison to that ugly fortune teller was unnecessary. He thought he should be more careful in selecting the criminals they wanted to help. Ah, tonight is the full moon of Minos, he thought. And under her light, all in this world become equal. Henceforth, he would help anyone who needed his counseling. After all, crime planning counseling is my job, he said. He remembered the Duke's adopted daughter. He said she was too young to get flowers from anyone. It turns out that the flowers he sent her were the first flowers in her life. He wondered what place she would take in the Duchess family. He was interested in watching the ordeal. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys, said the guy you, and I don't know yet. The singing of the birds woke up our little princess. She noticed a teddy bear next to her. It was so soft and beautiful. She wondered why he had different colored eyes. Suddenly she noticed an envelope with a letter and thought it was a card from Cullen. Since she couldn't read, she asked Cheyenne to do it. He saw her running around and asked her not to do that because her wound might open up. She said it was all right, for she had no pain. She showed him the letter, saying that when she woke up it was already lying next to her head. 
He saw the letter and said it must have been a gift from Mr. Cullen. It had taken quite some time to make. She asked him to read it. After reading the beginning, he said that it was indeed his gift and he had been meaning to give it to her for a long time. She wondered. She thought about whether it might be better to ask her father himself to read the card. He would surely be very happy then, the little girl thought. But what does it say? She asked. Cheyenne said that it talked about the new name he had given her. This fact shocked the little girl. She didn't want a new name because her mother had given it to her and it was connected to her. She didn't want it to just go away. She said aristocrat names are so long, she was afraid she wouldn't be able to learn them. Suddenly the Duke snuck up on them stealthily and said to let Shan read it all himself. He ordered him to read quickly in a proper manner. He began to read the letter, which said, Hello Princess, I am a teddy bear, hurry up and give me a new name. The Duke interrupted Cheyenne, telling him to read sincerely. Since I am now the princess's furry friend, I will also give you a new name as a gift. Well, are you ready to learn the new name the baby girl's father gave her? All right. Our princess charming new name is Letitia, which translates to the sky with a thousand moons. The letter says that he will protect Mistress Letitia from nightmares. His eyes are two jewels that will adorn the mistress's moonlight. Oh, that's right. And Les' name has the meaning of a child born on a Monday. Colin left Lele inside the new name. The baby could continue to hold in her heart the times when she was still living on the streets. In the midst of the thousand children born on a Monday, it was she who was given a thousand moons to shower the sky with today. The butler asked if she liked her new name. She thanked him for reading her letter. The Duke said that she had read the letter very well. Cyan, on the other hand, said that they were making fun of him. He asked the Duke did he really write it himself. The Duke said it was his secret. The Duke turned to the little girl, calling her by her new name, and asked if she liked her new name. She said yes and said it was very pretty. The Duke told the little girl that he had tried hard to think of a suitable name for her, for their first meeting had been akin to a fantasy. He was very happy that she liked her new name. She thanked her father and said she was really happy. He said since she couldn't remember and didn't know when her birthday was, they would consider her new birthday to be today. He said that day really does matter now. Besides, she survived being on the verge of death, and the doctor was told that the wound wasn't serious enough to die. But in fact, she really thought she was going to die at that moment. She said that she really thought it was the end of her. Nevertheless, he congratulated her on her birthday today, and they hugged each other tightly. She said she was going to go brag to Jade and ran off. She came running to Jade to tell him the news about her new name. When he woke up, he didn't understand what she meant. She said her new name was Letitia, and she added that today was her birthday. He said she had a very pretty name and that it suited her. He said that her father hadn't told him and that's why he hadn't made her a present. He said her teddy bear has beautiful gemstones. He said the red one is ruby and the blue one is sapphire. The little girl ran to her daddy, who was eating, and said he had something to tell her. She asked why he didn't give her a regular bear cub. She said she didn't need any other precious stones. She said he might spoil her. He said that's fine because he wants her to grow up in luxury and not deny herself anything. He wants others to be inferior to her. She said she would be hated later for that. He said that was good because she would be a spoiled child who could not live anywhere but the ducal house. That way she would be his daughter forever. He told her to accept at least this teddy bear and they would close the matter of expensive gifts. On the table was her first present, a cake that the little girl loved. The duke had prepared the cake without the butler's knowledge. It was her first birthday cake. She was very happy and grateful. All the servants gathered and decided to congratulate her on her first birthday in the Duke's family. And the rest of the family congratulated the baby girl on her 10th birthday too. She was wonderfully sweet and happy. On this beautiful day she turned 10 and she was born again already under a new name, Letitia. She will never forget her happiest birthday. A secondary story. One winter, several years ago, the Duke asked if he would like the gift. The butler said it was more important that he choose it himself. But Jade had enough things as it was. Suddenly the children who lived in the alleys ran away because they saw their master approaching. The Duke hoped they didn't run away because they saw him. Often the owner suspected the kids of stealing and chased them away. Among those children was our little girl. Duke told Scene to give the gold coin to the shopkeeper and told him to keep the lights on tonight. He thought Jade would throw away his gift anyway, so shouldn't he at least succeed in making a gift for the other kids? He thought the case for the red-haired witch was closed. A month after the little girl became Letitia, all she did all day long was sit in the manor. She was not allowed to go outside until she was fully recovered. She was a hardy student and spent all her free time reading. Her closet overflowed with the dresses Marianne picked out for her. 
Her health had also improved. She had been treated and slowly began to put on weight. She had also heard that it had been snowing more and more lately. Marianne was fascinated by Letitia's beauty. She could not believe her eyes and could not imagine that the girl in front of her was the same little girl who first crossed the threshold of this house. The little girl would be sailing on a boat for the first time. She had never traveled this far before. Did Jade feel regret when she had to sit in her room all summer? Either way, he kept his promise to take a boat ride with her. If she got sick, she would go home. Marianne did our little girl's hair beautifully. Marianne thought that very soon she would blossom into a beautiful girl. She wanted to keep watching little Letitia, but at the same time she was curious to see her adult appearance as well. And then there was the fact that being a saint, Marianne could not marry. Perhaps that's why she looks so upset. The little girl wanted to grow up soon and become a person like Marianne. She wanted to become a gentle lady with a beautiful appearance and a pure soul. Just as radiant as Marianne, Marianne called her pretty and reminded her of her habit. She liked to drink. Suddenly Jade came in and asked if she was ready. Marianne told Jade to learn how to drink from her. He said he was a good drinker without her advice. Jade thought that Marianne was a unique saint. She asked if Marianne would go with them. But Marianne said she had a celebration at the temple in the afternoon and wished them a good walk. At that time, the little girl did not yet know what would happen at the picnic she was looking forward to. And they began their journey through the beautiful places of nature. The little girl was in awe of the beauty. The little girl told Jade that she wanted the Duke to go with them. But Jade said that the Duke was attending a political meeting today. Even if it wasn't important, he had to be there. Suddenly some guys asked our heroes if they were going to Lenox Island. Jade immediately became disgruntled and angry, because he obviously knew these guys. He told his sister they seemed to be going there too. Afterwards he told her that they were just older guys in their studies, they weren't that close. Going to a birthday party once, that's all. The little girl wondered because she hadn't seen Jade attend the science academy. And it was mandatory to attend there every day. Jade said that as a rule you really had to go there every day because attendance points were very important. But it turns out that Jade wasn't acting right. One of the teachers at the science academy told Jade that he might just do well on the exam by meeting the attendance threshold. Their family is one of the few families in the kingdom with pure mage blood. You can just train in a magic tower and use that as an excuse, Jade said. Jade gave the little girl a shock after he told her that he'd only been playing with her lately, and therefore she was an accessory to the crime. The little girl wondered what the fees were for aristocrats to attend such schools, most likely high. She wanted to attend this academy of sciences too but she was already so grateful to be allowed to live in the Duke family. She felt like Jade was teaching her something bad. Jade told her that being a bad and distinguished person is the same as being kind and honest. You just have to act within the bounds of what is allowed. He reminded her that she didn't know the alphabet. He told her that her knowledge would improve markedly when she learned to read, but she could write a few words already. She said she could even write her own name, but of course she got it wrong sometimes. She has learned to write Duke's and Jade's names. Aristocrats often exchange letters with their loved ones. Her teacher taught her that. That's why she wants to write a letter to Jade too. Jade laughed and called the little girl funny. She didn't like that and asked him not to make fun of her. He asked her if she had a man she wanted to see. She remembered a boy who was her friend. His name was Walter. She used to live with him on the street together. He had helped her out a lot. She said she had been promised to pretend to be strangers if they ever met on the street. If someone got sick or even died, if someone was beaten to death for begging, or taken to an orphanage, if someone was lucky enough to get into a good place, they would pretend to be strangers and not look for each other. All the children knew that. Of course, they tried to be fair. They helped each other as long as it was okay. That was the basis of the promise. There were times when bad children tormented the little girl, but their rule was to forget everything when you set foot in the alleys. She was lucky, for winter would soon begin, and winter is very hard to survive. It's lucky to sleep under a blanket, trying to keep her icy feet warm. So she is eternally grateful to Duke and Jade. Jade asked her, didn't she say it was warm in the alley where she lived? Then she lied to make herself look good for the interview. She said she looked perfectly healthy. Except for one harsh winter, she was always warm, lied to Jade again. So be it, Jade said, but he wished the little girl hadn't thanked them for such obvious things. After all, his home is her home now too. She said the more obvious it was, the more grateful she would be to them. She had learned this from her mother in a past life. Jade told the little girl that he would thank her more often than too. For starters, he thanked her for crossing the threshold of their manor once, and he thanked her for recovering and going boating with him. A warmth threw in her chest. She was insanely grateful to him too. She threw herself into her brother's arms. 
it would have been wonderful to write about all her feelings on a card and keep them in her soul. And from then on, when she would have a hard time, she would remember that happy moment and go on with her life. There were very beautiful expanses all around, and the little girl liked them very much. The little girl asked Jade to go for a walk, but he stopped her, telling her that she was still sick, so she would get tired quickly if she overexerted herself. He reminded her that they had a whole day to entertain themselves. She promised to be more careful. She sniffed the flowers. They smelled really good. They were blue roses. On Lenok Island, these blue roses bloomed only once a year for three days. And now was that time. Jake had deliberately chosen today. There weren't many people here, and they could enjoy their picnic in peace. Jake asked not to touch them with his hands, for there were thorns on them. There were no people around at all. It was as if they had rented the whole island. The girl wondered if there shouldn't be a lot of people who wanted to admire such rare flowers. Jade said there were bad rumors about blue roses. They say the poison of blue roses can drive a man to madness. Anyone who comes to Lenok Island when the blue roses are in bloom will die. That was the spooky legend of the island. But Jade didn't believe the story. He thought it was superstition. It's kind of like a story where you fall asleep in a closed room with a fan on and die. Or you write your name in red pen and a ghost takes you away. Jade explained that two bodies had been found here a long time ago and that their deaths had occurred suddenly. The words gave the little girl goosebumps of fear. In fact, the flowers are blue because the energy of the magical stones buried in the bowels of the earth has temporarily changed the color of the roses. Before discovering this fact, everyone thought that people go crazy and die because of the poison in the roses. That is why it is called superstition. In reality, they are not poisonous. Suddenly, the same guys from the boat came out of nowhere. They told Jade that they hadn't seen him at the academy in a while. They asked what he was doing here, to which Jade said he hoped it wouldn't be crowded today, so he wanted to admire the flowers with his little sister. The boys were shocked because they didn't know Jade had a sister. The little girl didn't know how to say hello to them etiquette. Jade said it was nice to see them and suggested they continue to enjoy their time each separately. Suddenly, the boy came up to Jade and said that he hadn't lost his wit yet. He wanted the young lady to introduce herself. He introduced her and said she was his little sister. She introduced herself, and on hearing her name, the boys were horrified and their heartbeats increased. They thought she was cute. One guy introduced himself as Leon, and the little girl remembered having seen him somewhere before. The second said his name was Percy. The third was a third-year student in the student association Jay belonged to. The third introduced himself as Jax. He called our cutie a fairy. Jay then picked up the little girl, took her in his arms, and told her that his sister was shy with strangers. They unanimously called her very cute. Jade said if they ever touched her, they would be in big trouble. From him personally. The boys thought he was joking, but the little girl knew he wasn't joking. Shan called the boys in for lunch, but realized they were busy and said he would come back for them later. The boys began to eat their sandwiches, which had all the baby girl's favorite ingredients. After a long time, he finally got out for a walk with his little sister. What an unfortunate coincidence. Jade said they could finish their tea and leave. The boys said they were so lucky to all get out for a picnic together. Jade said they were just skipping class to pass the test of courage. The other guy in the crowd said he tried to stop him. He said let's not go there because of the dreaded curse of the blue roses. To the little girl, Leon seemed very familiar though she didn't know any aristocrats she knew. Leon offered to tell a funny story about Jade at the Science Academy. He said that when everyone was roughed up at the student association and he was asleep in the meantime, there was a very creepy atmosphere that day. One guy said that Jade owed it to his sister to give her a tour. The guy said that Leon was the best at grades among them, but compared to Jade, he was at an average level. He got even worse when he was young, when he was as old as Jade is now, he couldn't even speak properly then. I think he was 15. After that, Leon was suddenly cheerful. He didn't know then what had happened, but something had changed his character. Leon said it was just two of his only friends who always stayed by his side. The boys invited the little girl to a ball at their estate. Jade said their ball was for Nuva Rish people. She should have her first ball with them, he thought. The little girl understood that she was being treated like an aristocrat. Jade asked them why they, despite his sister's such a young age, were already discussing her debut into high society. He wanted to pick out the invitations to the ball with his father. Jade said she would go when she was older, then she could go wherever she wanted. But he warned her to choose only safe places. The guy in the crowd didn't understand how she could be so small and cute. Jade ordered him to stop acting like a monster that only talks about his sister's beauty all the time. The boys didn't recognize Jade, he had changed. It was the first time they'd ever seen him like this. 
Before he'd always walked around with an arrogant, expressionless face, Leon said he was going away to admire the roses for a while. He wanted to pick some blue roses for his little sister. She liked roses very much. He said he didn't believe what people had made up about the legend with the blue roses. Sis Leon passed away last year. He wants to gather flowers to place on her grave. Leon's little sister was an incredible beauty, and Percy's bride. They were engaged around the age of a baby girl, so they had known each other for many years. Elise lived in the country, and they didn't get a chance to see much of each other. She was beautiful. She died of pneumonia. Leon returned and asked what they were talking about. The little girl said that from the look on his face, he had heard everything. Leon said he had, and that was the only reason he called them here, because of Elise. His dead sister said she dreamed of seeing blue roses at least once. He just didn't want to have such sad conversations. Yesterday he was going through his things and found his sister's box and there were a lot of blue things in it. She was very fond of the color blue. Anyway, he was madly grateful to her. Grateful to Leon for still thinking of Elise and not getting engaged again. He said his family has nothing but money. He said that Elise was his first love, who was of noble birth and held a special place in his heart. But he was still grateful to him. After all, he did not demand the return of the jewels and money he had given as a gift in honor of his engagement. Thanks to that, his family was able to get back on its feet. He offered to see Elise. Elise would have been happy if Percy had brought roses to her. The little girl was sad, but at the same time pleased that the friendship between these boys was beautiful. Leon suggested we talk better about something more cheerful. He asked the little girl if she was interested in life at the capital. She told him that she had hardly ever actually been anywhere in the capital. He said there were so many wonderful places in the city. Since he himself is from the countryside, the capital was a whole new world to him. He still remembers his impressions of his first day at the academy. The tile on the floor showed the glimmer of a red sunset. He was very excited as he stepped off the train. The beats of the blue clock tower bell, the white doves flying past her. The years of her youth in the capital were the most beautiful. The girl knew that the metropolitan alley she had grown up in was not at all like that. But she thought, too, that the blue clock tower by the train station was very beautiful. She asked why he said that, as if it had happened a long time ago. Because it had. He asked if she liked everything. She said she liked it a lot and already wanted to come back here again. Jade said he was glad to bring her here after a long time. Suddenly she felt sleepy. She asked to be woken up. Asked me not to leave and not to leave her here alone. Her life seemed like a dream to her. She was afraid that she might disappear because of the slightest mistake. If she and Jade broke up here and she would have to live on the street again. She woke up and asked, how long had she slept? It was Cullen. Cullen thanked some lady for giving him a ride. She said they should definitely meet again. He invited her to a ball at his place. He sure is the main character, she thought. The Duke took the little girl in his arms and asked if she had a good time. She said yes, and asked why he had come to see her. He said he had come to see her. He saw how upset she was this morning. She said it was really just an excuse and that he just wanted a ride with those sisters. He said that wasn't true. Only his baby girl could make him come for her in a heartbeat. The Duke asked Jade, who are these gnats who chatter so casually with my daughter even without a chaperone? He was referring to those three boys. They apologized, saying they just wanted a cup of tea. They swore they had done nothing to disturb the young lady. The Duke asked them to tell him about themselves. The first introduced himself to Percy, who was a senior in their academy of cadets. He said they had met by chance. He said they didn't come out as parasites. The little girl wondered how they were so at ease having such a creepy conversation. He said he was only joking, because his daughter was very beautiful. A guy in the crowd asked how he managed to get free so early, since political meetings usually drag on for a long time. You didn't come because Letitia and I are having a good time together, did you? Asked a boy in the crowd. The Duke answered him that as of late his highness was not so diligent when it came to work, so they finished early. The Duke asked the guys what they were talking about. One of the lads answered the Duke that they were telling the young mistress about life in the capital. The Duke noticed that their faces had changed and asked what was wrong with their faces. He ordered them to tell them everything, if they had anything to say. The little one noticed it too, that they looked frightened. One of them said he was going to go get some fresh air and get some air. The two boys continued their conversation with Duke. They said they were interested in Hursov's magic items and business. One of the guys was thinking of using it as material for his graduate degree. He asked Herzog to talk about his time on the student council. Little noticed that Percy was getting sick. Letitia added that she was interested in anything to do with Duke, and Herzog began his story. Suddenly, the little girl felt sick. She asked when they were going home. 
Leon said he would call the maid, give them a signal with the mirror by the river, and they would be there in a jiffy. A sound was heard on the water. Leon said there was a lot of diving on Lenox Island, and he reassured the little girl. But there was something delaying Percy. He seemed to be very intoxicated. Leon asked everyone if they should go get him. He was worried about Percy, for he was not usually in the best state of mind after alcohol. Little thought he went to pick roses. Babe suggested before he left that we all go and look at the blue roses with Herzog. Suddenly everyone froze. Jade took Baby and hugged her. He asked her not to look. So what happened there? Just now it was Percy. They thought it was suicide. The girl saw the smile on her father's face, and she didn't know what it meant. He said to wait three seconds, count ten paces, and scream. Told them to call for those bugs and come back. In the meantime, they would examine the body. The little girl went to call them. She came running and told the guys that trouble had happened. They were shocked and didn't know what to say or do. They saw the boy who had died, and they were shocked again. The dead guy had wounds on his wrist and a blade in blood. Everything indicated that it was suicide. But how could Percy have committed suicide? It couldn't have been. He had a beautiful future ahead of him. That's what Leon thought. The other fellows said they were hardly ever away from each other, and no one came to that hold except their pain. There was only one place where boats could be sent from, and that's where they'd been all along. The little one thought, as did they, that it was suicide, but it was suspicious. Leon said it was all this fault, that he started the conversation about his little sister. Percy had long been tormented by her death, and he had reopened the wound. Impulsive suicide, there might even be a case. But why now? His fiancé had been dead for a year. Before he talked about Elise, he was joking and seemed happy. He didn't, did he? The father thought the little girl was scared. The little girl thought about how many times she had seen a man die before her eyes. The events of the novel she had time to read about had ended long before that. Now she knows nothing. The little girl told her father that she didn't want to hurt him, but his family was the first to discover Percy's body. Before he left for his walk, everyone was together. The father told the little girl that she was insinuating that they could conspire together, kill Percy, and called them out. She said it was because of all the rumors going around about their family. Judging by the blood already congealed, it's been about 30 minutes since his death. The Duke turned to Leon and told him that Percy died about the time he went to the river to give the signal. Leon was wary it looks like a perfect suicide. Under the circumstances, one might say all the people here were innocent. But he wasn't a doctor and he wasn't a detective, so he decided to leave it to the police. The little girl felt as if she had missed something. She had a strange feeling. She knew it wasn't suicide. Hoti asked how the little girl was feeling. She said she was fine. And then, as his hand touched her forehead, some vision came to her. It was someone else's memory, but she didn't understand who. And the man's face was familiar to her. Jade saw the frightened little girl. Her father told her to be patient. The police were going to be here soon, and they were going to come home. The little girl thought she saw an illusion with her eyes open. Father and Jade thought that when they arrived home, the little girl should go straight to rest. Now they suspected it was murder too. But it seemed strange to them. Perhaps there was someone else hiding besides them. But the island can only be landed from one place and by boat. Usually Lenox Island is quiet at this time of year, so if someone came by boat, they would have heard right away. Perhaps the real culprits were the mermaids. That's what Jade thought. But her father wanted to know everything after the investigation. The little girl thought it was unlikely that anyone would be hiding on this little island, or that the culprit was among them. She remembered the illusion, the sinner who would die at the hands of Cullen for Percy's murder. Percy was a master swordsman. Terrible. This young man had a great future ahead of him. He took his own life by slitting his wrist. So no wonder he used his skills to slit veins and arteries in one fell swoop. They've been getting into a lot of strange stories lately, the policeman said. Duke said there are so many strange things going on in this town, and it's just a coincidence. The policeman's name was Sergeant Sheldon. He asked to be called that. Hersog asked if he could go. The sergeant let him go. The father told the little girl it was time to go home. The friends were pained to realize that Percy was no longer with them. The little girl felt sorry for Leon. After talking about his dead sister, she asked to take him with her. She said she wanted to comfort him on the way home. She couldn't imagine how he would feel after such an unhappiness. She reasoned that if they were alone together, they would start blaming each other for not noticing Percy's loneliness. Seeing something like this made her very sad. Her father thought the little girl was kind. Jade took Leon and led the way. When they arrived, Leon said he could make his own way home. But the little girl stood her ground. She said he was pale, as if he would faint at any moment. He was very grateful to her for her care and said he was all right. 
His father insisted too, as did the little girl, and told him to sit down, for in their family it is customary to listen to all the carpings of children. If that's what his daughter wants, it's not hard for him to put him in the carriage and give him a ride home. The little girl was suddenly thinking, looking at Leon. His face showed that he had killed Percy today, using a very simple ruse. But why after all? Why had he killed Percy using such a method? She was interested in the details. If that was what she was thinking, she wanted to tell their father the reason now. Otherwise, she wouldn't rest until she shared it with someone. Cullen is a fair man, but he doesn't get into other people's life circumstances. This is also mentioned in the piece. The ending is unknown to her, but its content was depressing. And Cullen never found his happiness in the novel. They were almost there. It was here. The little girl turned to her father. She said that the ribbon tied around Mishka's neck had flown out the window. In the morning, Marion tied a ribbon the same color as the one on her hair around Bear's neck. Cullen told the maid that his daughter had dropped a ribbon on the way and asked her to find it. Liam, on the other hand, said this is where he would leave them. But the little girl said the place wasn't crowded, so it might be dangerous. He insisted, saying he didn't want to burden them any further. The little girl thought there was another reason entirely, namely that he needed to get off in that alley. She turned to Leon and said she had a few more questions for him before he left. She said it wasn't that important, but still, she asked if he had seen her before. He said it was impossible. He wouldn't be able to forget such a sweet girl. She asked who he really was. The little girl explained that she had seen him in the distant past. She suddenly asked Leon what color the clock tower at the train station was. He answered correctly, saying it was gold. The huge clock tower at the station is bright gold. But on Lenox Island, Leon said otherwise. He then claimed that the tower was blue in color. He got nervous. He justified it by saying he had a few drinks, and he must have misspoke. The little girl said it wasn't like that. She really is blue. That slip of the tongue made her riddle easier to solve. The clock tower at the train station is covered with a special paint. It is golden in the daytime and blue at night. For street children, the tower is a gathering place. To meet at the blue tower meant that the meeting would take place at night. Once friends called the little girl to watch the trains during the day, and they sneaked into the train station. Oops, the tower was definitely blue last time. Besides, normal people don't go to the station at night because there were no trains in the kingdom after 6 o'clock at night, and the passage is guarded. The only people who gather there are children from the village below, mostly just pickpocket thieves. She told Leon that she once saw him at a gathering place near the Blue Tower. She was from these parts, as was he. She asked Leon if it was true that he was from the village below. That's why he was so excited about today's incident. But she remembered his words. He had been told that he had been bored in the countryside. Colin didn't understand what was going on, didn't understand what was going on here. He asked them how it was. It was hard for him to make sense of it. There couldn't have been two lions, two people. Suddenly, Leon grabbed the little girl and put a knife to her throat. That's when my heart started beating faster. I almost lost my mind while I was reading it. He asked her to be still, but it wasn't that simple. What's going on here anyway? Are they twin brothers? Her illusions definitely had to do with her memories of Leon. At first she thought she had met two lions, but she hadn't. It turned out that they were twins. Colin ordered him to let his daughter go. If he let her go now, he would at least die without agony. That one yelled for him to let Leon out first, or he would make this girl uncomfortable. Colin asked what he was going to do, leave a scar on his daughter's cheek, or does he want to hurt her finger? Leon's copy or twin brother fell to the floor. Colin turned to him saying he thought if he started blackmailing him by threatening his daughter, there was nothing he could do and he would continue to stand still. Black magic, die in the most terrible agony, said Cullen. Leon, who had been sitting in the carriage, ran out and shouted, Lydeen. Jade put the knife to him and said he was going to kill him. The little girl screamed, asking him to wait. She wanted to hear them out. The little girl asked Jade and her father to leave the brothers alone and listen to them. Her father said that since the rascal had dared to put a knife to his child's throat, he would start by cutting off both of his hands. But after all, that would be like killing him. If you cut off his hands, he would die. The baby told her father that she felt fine and that she couldn't even have a cut on her neck. Her father said he wasn't interested in hearing the murderer's stories, but if she wants it that badly, there's nothing he can do about it. The little girl saw a snake and thought it was her father who had summoned it with his magic. She saw that one of the twins had wet clothes. Jay asked the boys when they had time to switch and asked which of the two of them killed Percy. Also, Cullen and Jade wondered how the little girl knew about it. She told them that wasn't what was important now, didn't they want to hear what had happened? They knew that their baby girl had the power to control them. 
To one of them, the Duke untied his mouth and told him that if he withheld anything, he would torture his brother until he died. Jade told Hersog that when he spoke such words, they should cover their little girl's ears, and she'd already heard everything. Colin ordered everything to be told in detail, how and why he did it. He killed Percy as planned. When Leon went to cut the roses, he switched places with his twin brother Lydine. While Lydine was talking to us, the lurking Leon killed Percy and disguised it as a suicide. When he signaled with his mirror, he switched places with Lydin again. A simple enough switcheroo trick. Dying, Percy didn't even let out a moan. The little girl suspected that they had given him some kind of drug. If they had, they would have guessed it, for ours are far from stupid. They covered his mouth with a handkerchief impregnated with the substance that caused him to pass out at once. Percy was easily persuaded. He always gave a list gifts of blue. One could understand Percy's soul by the late girl's gifts. Leon said he was not remorseful. He said Percy was a scoundrel and he bullied Elise. Their family was very poor, so as a baby one of the twins, Livin had to be put up for adoption in a family of distant relatives. But that family became angry, and Livin began to live on the street. Surprisingly, the girl also came from those places. It seems that's when she crossed paths with him. They met again when they were almost 10 years old. Did Lydon really live like that until now as one person? He said it was true. He and Lydon took turns attending the science academy. Even among twins, they resembled each other quite a bit. He wanted at least that way to give Lydon back his life as the son of a noble family. So he trained to become like each other, said the little girl. Jake understood why sometimes he noticed, as if there were a completely different person in front of him. Jake asked them why did they kill Percy. They said because he was responsible for Elise's sickness. They were sure of it. Every year Elise grew more beautiful, so young young men with titles and riches lined up to propose to her. Among them were even those who offered to pay the penalty for breaking off the engagement and accept his proposal of marriage. Upon learning of this, Percy did something. Cullen figured it out. The scumbag had only money on his mind, which was why he'd set the whole thing up so ridiculously. The little girl realized that that wasn't all there was to it. Liam called the little girl unusual and said that it was as if there was a completely different person in her little body. Liam pointed out that she was right, and it didn't end there. Percy gets very drunk at the summer manor and starts harassing Elise. When Percy gets drunk, he becomes a different person. Unfortunately, besides Percy, there were several other scoundrels there. They got Percy drunk, and he got very drunk, so he dared to touch Elise. Jade realized that he had just done a disgusting thing. The little girl thought that Elise had committed suicide. Leon noted that when noble families say that an unmarried girl died of pneumonia, often such a thing means that she committed suicide. Before she died, she told them the whole truth, and afterwards she slit her wrists. The little girl realized that they wanted to kill Percy in the same way. Cullen understood that they wanted to kill him because they wanted revenge. He realized that one of them hadn't even grown up with her. Leon said it was only once. They spent a week together at the homestead. It was an unusually happy time. Memories of those times still sustain them. If you look into the little girl's memories, something is different there. But how? Leon said he committed the crime. He said that Cullen could use him for his black magic experiments. He asked for Leiden's release. Cullen said he didn't need the material for his experiments. It's all gossip. Leon wanted to ask the little girl something afterwards. He asked her how she guessed that she and Lydon had arranged to meet here. She said it was easy. She saw Jade and Cullen burning her with their gaze. While Percy was away, they were together the whole time. If Percy had really been killed, that meant there was someone else on the island besides them. But the police searched all over Lenock Island and found no one. So the perpetrator got away before the police arrived. Opposite the place where they docked there is a sky bridge. Panel bridge. The distance from the water is enough to allow them to swim under it. Plus, there's a tunnel under the bridge that goes underground. And that's where they were right now, where this underground passage goes. All the street children knew about this secret tunnel. And our little girl was no exception. Jane knew that, thanks to that little caveat, she had come to a similar conclusion. The little girl knew that if Leon knew about the night tower, he was certainly aware of this place too. It was hard to believe, but she was incredibly smart. The little girl thought that thanks only to her imagination and the detective novel she had read in a past life. I wonder what kind of story the older brother, who had nothing to do but kill his dead younger sister's fiancé, would tell. Jade asked Cullen what he was going to do with them. He knew himself that he could, as usual, mercilessly deal with the culprit. Cullen said he sensed that someone was going to kill Percy. So he decided to check on Jackson Leon and see who the culprit was so he could find him. 
Okay, Lydine, he might not have known, but Leon had committed a crime, and people like him aren't usually spared by Cullen. Jade felt sorry for them. He said that if anyone dared touch his little sister, even though he didn't want to imagine it, but such an act would make him so angry that he would be ready to kill one of the twins right away. Anyway, this time they could be forgiven. So thought Jade. Now it was the little girl's turn. They asked her opinion. The little girl understood that the decision was hers. The girl was advised not to take the side of those scoundrels. Cullen says he can't even imagine that the little girl might want to let them live. As a father, he tries to reason in cold blood. Jade voted to kill her too. The little girl didn't know what to do now. It looks like childish jealousy. Jade said it was unanimous. You are sentenced to death. If it weren't for that illusion, poor people. Even though the little girl hadn't met a in person, she felt sorry for her. The little girl wanted the Duke to do something she wouldn't regret later. She knew what kind of man Cullen was. A dark hero who goes after criminals. A grim character in the piece. Of course, regardless of the crime, Cullen shows no mercy to criminals, but let him make a different decision this time after hearing it. She did not want him to taint himself. Lydon and Leon are different from those he has killed before. Cullen was very grateful to the little girl. If it weren't for her, they wouldn't know the whole truth. The little girl wondered. She knew that Cullen had changed his mind after hearing Elisa's story. She asked in that case not to kill them but to give them to the police. Cullen asked Leon if he remembered the names of Percy's friends, the ones who were still at the manor house. And you can't forget them even in your dreams. He wanted to meet them. He told them he would let them go if they told him their names. It was all thanks to his daughter spoken like he was asking to be introduced to good people. Jay told Leon that it would be great if the next time they met, he would show him up in person. He said he was beginning to like him. But as soon as he talked to his sister, Jade would kill him. He said that he was the only one who killed his sister's enemy extremely easily. If it were him, Jade would have made him suffer a long time before he died. Cullen says it's always like that. You take out one and he's left a pile of garbage behind. He said not to worry, he's good at it. If somebody does something wrong, they should be punished. That was his rule, and the little girl knew it. Cullen absorbs mana from human bodies. People who feed on mana are nicknamed devourers. There were only three instances in which he can absorb a greaser, assassins, the recently deceased, and those who have touched an innocent girl. This crime is considered the most serious. After all, to Cullen, murderers and rapists are one and the same. Though she, too, thought that the people who tortured Elise should die, the twin brothers were very glad they hadn't been killed. They could not believe the fact. They asked, would they be let go so easily? Cullen said they would. But they must remember that those who have once tasted blood are unlikely to change. He put his mark on them. If they do anything wrong again, he will catch them first. He asked the girl to come to him. He also thanked his brothers for the treat afterwards, but they didn't know what he meant. He added that he meant Percy. His corpse was fresh. Another of Cullen's rules about eating eaters, count to three, scream, then take ten steps. Jade said it made his heart feel better to think that Percy was so mean. However, he didn't feel comfortable when his father swallowed up someone he knew. Leon asked, what did Jade mean by that? Cullen said he was having so much fun cleansing the world of crazy people. He was sure he had real adventures ahead of him if he went after his little girl. The father told the little girl that he now knew who she was. The little girl panicked. She thought he told her secret and she got scared, but she wasn't. He called her a genius. You can exhale now. Jade said she was a liar. It had happened more than once before, certainly not by accident. The little girl judged everything, said she didn't think she could guess. Jade reminded her that she wasn't trained anywhere, happened to memorize shapes and letters she'd never seen before. She told him that if she had that ability, she wouldn't be living on the street anymore. She didn't understand how it was either. It was supposed to be a cold winter this year. It was a pity for the children who were left outside. The girl claimed to them that she was an ordinary child, but Cullen wanted to test her. He had doctors he knew who had examined Jade before. They were the ones who would find out about the little girl's talent. The baby knew that they would know right away from the test that she wasn't a genius, and then he would reject her. Cheyenne, where the butler, greeted our boys. He was very glad to see them. He reminded me that they were back very late. He saw the little girl, who looked tired, and asked Cullen what had happened to her. He told him that many things had happened, but the most important thing was that his little girl was a real genius. She and didn't know what he was talking about. The little girl went into her room and plopped down on the bed. She was very tired. She had no idea that Cullen would be talking about her all through dinner. Jade went to her room to see if she was okay. She said she was fine. He asked her why she was always sad when they passed that intersection. 
She said that she used to live in a deserted alley behind the intersection. Every time they pass, she remembered those cold days. It was her past. Always when she thinks about it, it gets cold. Well, and it was too bad about her friends. Jade, on the other hand, said she shouldn't worry. But the little girl said they had a rule. They didn't forget about each other. Jade told her to back off properly. The little girl had a vision when Cullen touched her hand. The story in the book she had read in a past life was different. But what was it? She didn't know when or why such visions appeared, and how she would relate to it. She didn't know. A few days later, Cullen had never once mentioned the little girl's genius, and she assumed he had forgotten. He asked her if she wanted some fresh air. Her father told the little girl that Marion had told him that she liked the cafe they had visited the last time. He had some business nearby and suggested that she stop by. The little girl was glad of this and ran off to get dressed. Shane shouted to her not to hurry. He told her to tell the maids to get her dressed. And they went on a long drive. Cullen, after seeing her outfit, called her a cutie. The little girl wanted to hold hands. Cullen responded to her proposal by saying that she drove him crazy and hugged her. After that incident on Lenox Island, the babe held Cullen's hand at every opportunity, but nothing ever happened. Not even now. She really didn't know what that ability was. She was walking down the streets and she saw Dr. Siebel's Research Institute. Cullen said this was where she would take the test. The little girl thought it was an intelligence test, but realized that Cullen had deceived her when he said they were going to a cafe. Cullen, on the other hand, said it was all about her. It would be over very quickly. The little girl didn't want to see a doctor. Dupe's a liar, she screamed. The doctor was pleased to welcome the lady and asked her to come this way. She did not understand what kind of doctor he was, for he was very young. Cullen said that he would be back soon, he had some things to finish. He asked her not to worry about the little girl, and said the guards would be standing outside. If he gets her daughter rude, he'll be in big trouble. The doctor said no such thing would happen and he would take care of her. Cullen said he would come back after he finished his business, but in the meantime she would talk to the doctor. He asked her not to be afraid. The doctor told the little girl that this was the first time he would meet her and said his name was Seibel. Suddenly the doctor started laughing. Neither I nor Leticia understood the reason for her laughter, and of course she asked what he was laughing about. He said it was because she just looked so cute, like she was a lost puppy. The baby told him that she thought all doctors were old and gray. The doctor said he just recently came of age. People who were able to get their degrees at such a young age are called geniuses. He said Hersa brought her here to find out her level of intelligence. People like doctors help people like the little girl. He asked her not to worry, for Hersov and he just want to help her. But Letitia was just grateful for his care, but she did not need his help. She told him that she was an ordinary person, she was not a genius. He asked the little girl not to worry. He explained that such testing takes place in any noble family. The little girl did not understand what he meant. He explained that loving parents believe that their children are real geniuses and bring them to him. Baby already doubted that Cullen was a loving father. She already thought he was an arrogant liar after that. The doctor said that it happens that parents' faith in their child's genius is lost. They refer to those who simply want to gain advantage by using their own children. But Herzog was far from that. If she really was a genius, the doctor was bound to help her. The little girl didn't understand why she would do that when she knew she had no talent anyway. She didn't like that. The doctor already knew that she did not know the alphabet and decided to just ask her questions. He asked in what form would she like to answer his questions. Perhaps in an entertaining way? He forgot where he put the assignment sheet and started looking for it and accidentally bumped his head. The little girl was afraid something was wrong with him, but he said otherwise and apologized. He said they could get started on the test. Baby saw the doctor's clumsiness and also thought he was handsome. Then Dr. Sybil told a very interesting story. He showed her a labyrinth and asked her how many exits it had. He showed her the maze, the numbers, and began to ask about the connection between the beginning and the end of the story. The little girl could only answer some of the questions from his test. But come to think of it, in her present life and in her past life, she didn't learn anything. Once she got sick, her attendance at school was quite rare. He pulled out the chessboard and asked another question. The doctor wondered why the little girl could not get out of the maze in any way. The little girl surmised the solution, because the first night had destroyed the road, and the other one was closed too. While she was trying to figure out the reason, two hours had already passed, and in that time she realized that his riddle was quite interesting. Afterwards, the doctor said he needed to summarize the test results. He asked her to wait. The little girl thought that being a genius wasn't so cool. They remember everything they've read about, come up with new things, can calculate decimal numbers and count them in their head. Something like that. 
She knew that many parents thought their children were geniuses, but in the end, they were disappointed in them. She thought that Cullen hoped she would continue to help him with his work. She remembered that he had promised her he would listen to her and always ask her opinion first. But if she couldn't help that he would be upset, she thought it would get her kicked out. But he might not kick her out, but he would definitely start bullying her, like making her do the housekeeper's bidding. She didn't know what to do. Thinking about it made her feel worse. The results wouldn't come tonight after all. Colin went back to her and asked her how she was feeling. She said she was sorry, but she wasn't a genius at all. Colin didn't know what she meant. The little girl explained to the Duke that she had not answered any of Dr. Siebel's questions. She said she had an ordinary memory, which means there is nothing she can do to help him. Herzog asked what she meant by help. He did not understand what she meant. She thought he would be upset if she wasn't clever. He told her to calm down. He called her a sweet and kind girl. That's so sweet. Cullen said that after all, they don't say for nothing that daughters are a father's happiness. He was in agreement with that. He told her he didn't expect anything. He was just worried about her. He said that people of ability are born into their family, and it was no surprise that he and Jade quickly earned degrees. But she thought she was different, because she wasn't his real daughter. That's what she thought. That's not what he meant, he said. He explained that sometimes it happens that people are already born with these skills. More often than not, their lives end in suicide or they become depressed. They are very unlucky because it is very hard to manage mental abilities properly. Her father told the little girl that Jade was also weak when she was a little girl, but not as weak as she was. So he felt it necessary to prepare ahead of time in case she did turn out to be a genius. It was regardless of his expectations that he was still excited about his daughter. Any parent would be happy for a child as smart and sweet as her. But she told him otherwise. She didn't think she was smart. Her father said she didn't have to be smart. It's not so bad to be silly, he said. She asked who needs them, the stupid ones? They can't do anything. He said it was her responsibility to spend her daddy's money. He could provide for her everything. That was the kind of daughter he always wanted. He hugged her so tight. It was all very sweet. The little girl thought he had a bit of an odd approach to comforting her. He noticed that she had stopped crying. Baby knew that she would regret it later. He asked her if she would mind going to the cafe. But the little girl already doubted again that they would go to the cafe. She thought he had tricked her. He said of course he would make good on his promise by buying her anything she wanted. She said she wanted chocolate cake. Herzog said that he would always be happy despite the results and in the meantime he suggested waiting for the doctor and talking to him. She said the test was fun. The doctor came in and said the results were in, but their conversation might take a little longer than he thought. The Duke asked for a summary. After all, it's lunchtime for the little girl. The doctor said that the young lady is not a genius who needs a skills assessment, but according to the test results, she has excellent abilities. She has talent, which confirms her giftedness. Giftedness. The little girl asked back. The Duke asked the doctor to explain what all this meant. The doctor said that the young lady showed an excellent knowledge of languages. She is quite eloquent, and with this level of education, her reasoning and problem-solving skills are very good. She remembers more than the average person, but the strangest thing is her ability to count, even though she has never been taught to do so. In other words, the young lady has a rare talent. He advised her to study as much as she could. He said he felt that his daughter was a genius, and the little girl kept insisting that she was not. But Cullen said gifted or genius, isn't that the same thing? And yet, she's also cute. Her father told the little girl that she could be anything. But if she was smart and rich, life would seem much more interesting to her. It's on her father to organize the festivities and on her to learn all the new things. He suggested that she go out to eat chocolate cake. The doctor told the Duke that he understood that he was very busy right now, but that he needed to talk to the young lady urgently. He offered to talk inside. The Duke told him that he hoped they had talked enough already. But if he still had something left, then he would have to talk. But he didn't want to go inside, he told them to talk right here. The doctor said the client had to be open and honest with the doctor and needed to be unaccompanied by his parents. So alas, Cullen's gaze is so piercing that it seems as if he is ready to claw at the doctor. The girl walked into the doctor's lab and was surprised. The doctor noted that he does a lot of research to solve this or that question. He explained to her that there are actually special courses for people like her. But he said that the Duke would not let her, for he cares very much for her. It is a special institute that is quite far away. The girl noticed that something was wrong here. The doctor knew that the girl had already guessed that this was the final test. He suggested she take the final test for fun. She was hidden in this room. The girl noticed that the wooden table, the guest chair, and the closets were the same size. 
These rooms had similarities. By removing the papers and equipment, they would be almost identical. It turns out she needs to find the differences. If you start looking for obvious differences, one of them is the painting. Although both depict a forest landscape, the one in the other room with crossing paths among the woods, and the other depicts flowers growing along a fence. A cross and a circle. She asked the doctor if there was a cross and circle book. After all, she had not yet learned the alphabet. The doctor said, as expected, gifted people are very different. How a young lady who has not yet learned the alphabet can solve riddles so perfectly he could not understand. The title of the book was indeed a cross and a circle. This book must be the answer, but it didn't seem so simple to her. There was a circle on the book, and she remembered that such a symbol was on the shelf as well. It felt as if someone had drawn it. She understood it meant there were two circles and one cross. What if the cross meant plus? So you have to connect the two circles. That would make a snake biting its own tail. This sign means infinity. A book called infinity, she said, or something similar. The doctor pulled out a book called The Eternal Admirer. The doctor said she did a good job of finding it. The cross and circle was also the right answer. He didn't think she could come up with it. The doctor said he had more riddles, but perhaps they would end there, for the Duke had run out of patience. The little girl was having a lot of fun. He gave her his card and told her that the address of the lad was on the back of the card. He told the little girl that people like her would eventually realize how different they were. When the doctor was a kid, he went through the same thing. His job is to be a teacher who helps children like her. If she felt lost, he advised her to come to him because the door to the lab was always open to her. She thanked him for that. The doctor said that Duke was proud of her talent, and then she realized why Duke was so excited. He was just proud of her. Colin knocked on their door and said that they had been there a long time, and that seemed suspicious to him. The doctor said everything was fine. He just gave the young lady a chance to take another test. The young lady confirmed the doctor's words. The Duke said that the doctor looked like a comedian, not a doctor. The little girl asked her father if he was really proud of her, as Dr. Sibyl said. She added that she was proud of her father too, and would always be with him. Her father said it would be great if she would start calling him daddy from now on so he wouldn't feel uncomfortable. But there will be no hurry. The Duke told the doctor that they were leaving, and he would send someone to pay. The doctor waved his hand and told the little girl to come again. But what happened next? I found it all suspicious. The doctor said that, as he had been told, the girl was very interesting. If she had continued her search, she could have found the real answer. After all, it was not in the phrase well done, but in the flower. Also, don't forget one thing. The next riddle question, where is the real Dr. Sybil located? She found the right answers, but not the real one. Then the whole problem is imagination, he thought. Perhaps a little cruelty in life would help her develop. The doctor came over and said, sleep tight, the real Dr. Sybil. Now let me borrow your name. It's very useful to me. He thought Letitia was going to be an amazing woman. He was looking forward to this moment. Chapter 31 begins with two people talking and a third person joins them. The first claimed that the man over there had broken his friend's arm. The second one asked him for some proof. Then they started discussing the news. They said Percy had killed himself because he couldn't get over his fiancé. The third guy said he was a fool because you could find women of all tastes nowadays and there was nothing special about her. If he'd found out we touched the woman he'd chosen, he'd have been angry, so he left. But that wasn't the case. There was Cullen. Well, hello, Cullen said to him. Cullen said his friend had told him about him, so here he was. I think his name was Percy, Hazel de Dite, a pervert who covered up a woman's murder with money. There were a lot of cases where he traumatized girls, and 15 more left uninvestigated. Garbage like him is a real gift to Cullen. Cullen was surprised that he was still alive. He was sure he wouldn't be able to say a word now. He wanted to start dinner already. As expected, food tasted better when it was still breathing. The boy didn't understand what was wrong with him. He didn't know Cullen. He didn't understand why he couldn't talk. Cullen told him it would hurt a little, but it would happen quickly. He had lived as a demon, so he would die as one. Now that he has a daughter, the first thing I will do is get rid of crazy people like him. I am Cullen de Levelton. That scene gave me goosebumps. Colin told him to remember his name, the name of the one who would kill him. It would be his last mercy. He had planned to have a little fun with his friends though, but he suddenly changed his mind and decided to kill him first, say hello to Percy. He called his snake, Bale, and told her to have a good meal. He remembered about his daughter, who should have already finished her test and left. Apparently, this scene was while his daughter was taking her last test. Colin and his daughter came to the cafe. The little girl said she couldn't eat that much. One chocolate one would be enough for her. Cullen noticed that at times like this, the little girl always had a stern face. 
The little girl said she would have two after all. Colin said to bring all the chocolate desserts. A lovely tray of all sorts of sweets was brought. He told her to eat quickly and wished her a good appetite. The little girl was drooling. The little girl asked her father where he was while she was waiting for him. She said he looked happy, even his tie was tied differently. He said it was Xiang's doing. He is excellent at tying bows and ties. His clothes got a little wrinkled after work. He understood that the girl was smart. He didn't understand how such a cutie could be so smart. He told her that he ran into his old buddy, and they exchanged a few words. She wanted to say hello to him too, but her father said she wouldn't meet him because Cullen and he weren't that close. The little girl said that adults have a lot of familiarity. Hesel's body should be gone by now. Finding the corpse won't do anything. Eventually the case will be recorded as an unknown cause of death. The low rate of catching criminals in the kingdom is acceptable for now. And that was good for Cullen, for he had no time to be bored in the capital. On top of that, he got this little girl. Cullen told the little girl that he really liked her a lot. To him she was outwardly very sweet, mysterious, intelligent, and a little suspicious. Cullen told the little girl that he hoped every day would be like this one. But she didn't understand his words and asked what kind of day is this? He said that her mere existence made the world perfect. She thanked her father for such words, she was very pleased, but his such words embarrassed her a little. Her father said he would be embarrassed if he couldn't make her happy. She wondered if Cullen had said such words to Jade. Still, she was glad that Duke was happy. He hoped and waited for the little one to call him daddy. Regardless, it was a great day for him. The waitress thanked the boys and told them to stop by again. Suddenly, Xtayan and Jade came to get the baby girl. They told her to get in the carriage. What kind of day is it today? The girl froze. They drove past that alley again. No wonder she was cold. Suddenly, she noticed something amiss. Her street had changed. The street on which she lived. The owner of that house pretended like he didn't see their garbage business, and the warehouse where they snuggled together for warmth. Everything was gone. There was a sign about a children's shelter. Hmm, interesting. The street where the girl lived changed. The owner of that house pretended not to see their garbage business, and the warehouse where they snuggled together to keep warm. Gone. There was a sign about a children's shelter. There was even a fireplace in the middle of the building. The girl asked her father, What is this place? He replied that it was his and Jade's project. For she had said that she was very worried about her friends and they had decided to give her a gift. Jade said that when they drove by this street, the little girl was losing her mood. P wondered. He wondered what to do to get her to stop being sad driving by this place. Cullen said she's just a kid. Adults know much better what their children are thinking. Her father asked the little girl if she wanted to break the promise she had made to her friends or not. The little girl told her father the other day not to pay any attention to it. Such is the pattern that we forget those we don't see for a long time. She asked Jade why he said that. Cullen said he bought all the houses on that street and paid generously for them. The owners must be quite happy. They combined all the buildings to make one big room. Cullen said that only the children could go in and get warm there throughout the winter. The little girl thanked her father for that. He said he was her father, and there was no need to thank him for that. A father who wants to be called daddy. Jade, on the other hand, said he liked it when she called him by his first name or brother. The girl was not at all accustomed to calling Cullen daddy. She could have left this family at any moment, and she could have expected a lot from him as her own father. But now who knows, and she hugged Cullen and called him daddy after all. Afterwards, she went into Jade's arms and thanked him very much and called him big brother and added that this was the happiest day of her life, and she never would have thought she would get to experience the greatest joy in the world. She said she was very happy to have such a daddy and big brother. Jade told her not to forget the words she said. Even though they were a little scary, they made her feel good. She wanted to be a member of their family. Jade said they didn't care if she lived as Lee or Letitia, he just asked her to try to put out all the bad thoughts she had experienced living on that street. Sheehan said that this house would carry a piece of her name, Leg, that she would always be able to keep the children warm. Jade said he had looked for Walter, but could never find him, and they said he had left town not too long ago. The girl was upset and wondered where he might have gone, had he found work elsewhere, or was he living downtown now? Jade asked if he should find him. She said that if Walter wanted it, then there was no need to worry, for wherever he was, he would be fine. She knew that Walter should have died at William's hands, but his fate had chosen a different path. She wished, even though she would never meet him again, that his life would be better than the present one. That day she found a new home and her cold winter days were over. Some guy reads a newspaper, and it says of a sequence of deaths of young nobles from unknown causes. Kanjan de Rubel was one of those who tormented Elise. 
This guy asks, is he the third after Hazel? Was it the Duke's doing? That's what the two guys were discussing. It was those twins. The first one says they can only speculate. And if you think about it, the doctor and the Duke are similar in some way. The second one said that maybe because they didn't look human. The first wasn't sure, but it seemed to him that the two had the same energy. Even when they did incredible things, their eyes didn't blink. The first maintained that he wouldn't be surprised if Lady Letitia was all right. The second also told him to stop talking about the young lady. They even left her a flower. Though whether she could see it, they doubted it. And the other said he agreed she had saved their lives. He still has in his mind what would have happened to them if not for her. They weren't allowed to tell the young lady about the doctor. The other said they didn't plan Percy's murder, the doctor did. And he knows how to approach such things properly. If only he could, he would have killed long ago, he shouted. Then a scene is shown where Dr. Sibyl walks up to the guy and introduces himself to him and says that he comes to the academy a lot for work. The doctor points to Percy and asks the boy if he's the one who insulted their sister and got her killed. The doctor said he understood them perfectly, they must be very upset. The doctor asked them if he could help him kill Percy. Percy easily fell for Dr. Sibyl's plan, but the Duke and Leticia intervened. The plan failed, and Leon and Lydine had no choice but to tell the doctor that Letitia had been able to guess their guilt, and the Duke let them go. Without a word, he ordered them to deliver the flower. The brothers, however, left a blue rose in place of the red flower, as a symbol of an apology of gratitude to Letitia, and danger. We had already disobeyed the doctor by not delivering the red flower, they said. Leon wanted to warn the young lady that the doctor knows her. Leon told his brother that he was the one who told him about her. And now that's it. If the Duke found out, he would kill them. His brother said he understood his guilt. He offered to leave here right now, as if nothing had happened. The other didn't know what to say, so he didn't say anything. He said it was the last thing and told him to hurry up. He asked Leon why he was standing still, what he was staring at he didn't understand, and Leon noticed some man. It was the doctor who was apologizing to the other man for not noticing him and hitting him. The twin brother told Leon it was time to get out. Suddenly the doctor came up to them and asked where they were going. So there they were, aren't they going to the train, the doctor thought. The doctor asked the twin brothers why they were leaving and didn't even say goodbye, he was upset. Leon told the doctor that because of their indifference, they could not say goodbye to him. He said he was really sorry. The doctor told him not to worry. As it turns out, Letitia is a pretty smart girl. There is fate after all. He said he had recently opened a lab and Lady Letitia came to see him. He was so glad to meet her, even if only once. She was the one whose future he was looking forward to right away. Leon asked the doctor if he had done nothing to her. The doctor answered him that of course he hadn't. He said that precious things should be handled carefully if you want to get them in the future. The young lady was perfect for him. He had seen one like her for the first time. He called her innocent, intelligent, and beautiful. The doctor also reminded them of their punishment, to which the brothers were very surprised. The doctor told them that they had an agreement. He said that he did not ask for a reward for killing Percy. Instead, he had another request. He said to commit the crime without the police noticing, and to leave the red flowers at the crime scene. But they failed, and in doing so, disobeyed his last order. The doctor asked Leon, didn't he say that his only recourse was always to complete the crime? The doctor said there was no point in accomplishing the goal if they were exposed. He told him that they had been caught by the Duke and it was time to pay for their sins. His twin brother came in and said they had a train to catch. The doctor asked them, where were they going? To Sentiac, which is to the north? Or where? They said they weren't. They told him they were headed west. Rumor had it that there was a job opportunity there. He called that strange. He asked why the ticket said otherwise. Leon took the ticket and checked it out. Suddenly people started screaming and reporting a fire. They turned their attention to it. People were saying there was a fire on that train. Apparently the one the twin brothers were supposed to be on. An employee working at the station told everyone to leave the station. The twin brothers noticed that they did not have tickets. They asked the doctor for their tickets back. The doctor handed the tickets to the brothers and said, sure. But suddenly he said they would pay with their lives. He told them goodbye. He also added that he had fun getting rid of all kinds of garbage. He was also very grateful to them. He thanked them for meeting Lady Letitia. He asked them not to worry and said he would treat her with the utmost respect. The Duke had the same. The doctor said that as a sign of his respect for them, he would let them die without any pain. And they died. An explosion on a train graced the headlines of the capital's newspapers.
The fire broke out for an unknown reason in the cargo compartment, which was unmanned. It was quickly extinguished, but the next day another terrible event occurred. A guy passing by noticed all this horror. Two brothers had died together. They had blue roses in their mouths. Jade read in the article that the corpses had their eyes closed as if they were asleep, their heads pressed together like Siam's twins, and blue roses coming out of their bodies. That's what the paper said. Cullen said it said they were twins, but it never revealed their identities, but according to his contact in the newsroom, they were Leon and Ladine. Jade felt sorry for them. He said he wanted so much to avenge his little sister and be happy. She had asked Jade if he really thought a murderer could be happy. Jade told him that he had never thought about it. Jade wasn't sure, but now his life had become even more beautiful in recent days all thanks to his father. He said he was filled with happiness when he saw his little sister, wherever she was. He wanted her to know sooner, for real, what happiness was. Cullen said that even though Jade was his son, he didn't know what was in his head. Jade said this because he is his father. Jade said that he loves Letitia very much and has felt happy over the past few days. He told his father that he could stop pretending to care about him. For it didn't look good to him. Suddenly their conversation was interrupted by Sheehan. Jade told Sheehan that he had repeatedly told him that while they were talking he should be as quiet as furniture. The Duke ordered Sheehan to get that paper out of Letitia's sight. He knew that if she knew what had happened to Leon, she would cry hard. And that's a fact. Sheehan said he would do his best. The Duke said it would soon be forgotten. That's what he thought and he added that gruesome murders often happen in the capital. Sheehan asked the Duke what had upset him so much. It was all very strange to the Duke. He had the feeling that he was being challenged. Although no red flowers had been found so far, he kept seeing someone's shadow. He said that among the other twins, the ones he had saved had been killed, and they were killed in an unusual way. Could it be that the souls of those people he killed decided to take revenge on him? He thought it was all very strange indeed. Cheyenne told the Duke that he was exaggerating. He told him to take care of Letitia for now, that he should not allow her to be alone. If suddenly Marion wants to see her, let her come to their house with pleasure. Now winter has come. The little girl spent all her time at home. All the fun was here now. Cullen and Jade were still busy, and Cheyenne said she couldn't go outside and be alone. She asked him if she could walk outside, but the servant replied that it was cold outside, and she went for a walk in the morning. If she went outside again, she might catch a cold. She said that the sun had not yet set, and she asked to walk a little more, just a little more. The butler said okay, but just a little bit. The little girl screamed with joy, and promised to go out just a little bit. The butler noticed that the little girl ran out without a finger, and ordered her to put it on, for she would freeze to death. But she said that if she wore a lot of clothes, she would look like a snowman. The butler, in turn, said that a warm snowman is much better than a frozen mistress. The little girl went for a walk, the servants following her. Suddenly, her ball got pricked. The servants said she would pick it up herself and ordered the little girl not to go after it. But the little girl said to wait only a minute. She blinked there and back. Suddenly, she noticed something amiss. It was a blue rose. The little girl thought because the season of blue roses is already over. Who could have put it there? Maybe Leon? The little girl thought. Suddenly the servants called her back and she ran to them. The murder case at the academy was closed. The little girl was lying on the floor drawing something. The servant went up to her and asked what she was drawing. He thought she was drawing mansions. She said they were mansions and that was her homework. He asked what color would be in the picture here. She said it would be blue. He realized that the drawing would then be day and not night. The servant told the little girl that she drew well enough. The Duke is especially fond of the palace. He asked that she would show him the drawing when it was finished. She said she wouldn't because Papa is good at drawing and playing musical instruments. And if he saw that horror, he'd be sure to laugh. But the butler said that even clumsy, she looks very nice. The baby told Chayim, that was the butler's name, that he often talks like daddy. And he told the baby that he only said that because he liked her admirable drawing. The little girl told Cyan that he had a lot of work to do, and he had time to play with her on top of that. He told her that watching over his mistress was one of his most important duties. Cyan is in charge of the mansion instead of Cullen. He is not the one who should be checking on her tasks. The little girl said that if he suddenly stayed here, Hurtsum might scold her, since it's not his job to entertain her. But Cyan said it was the other way around. If his lordship and the young master found out that he'd have been amused during their absence, he would not be well. But he was only taking care of the little one, and they might misunderstand and become angry. The baby asked the butler why he thought they wouldn't be happy about it. 
He reasoned that they are very jealous and have great affection for those they love. Babe sighed. The servant asked the little girl if that was her only homework for today. She told him that she still needed to read and write a poem. He said that was a lot to do. She said it was easy for someone to write a poem, but not for her one bit. She didn't want to devote her whole life to this writing and coloring. It wouldn't do any good. She wondered why the nobles were the ones learning to write poems. She told Butler that she really didn't understand how to write them, what intonation was and so on. He said that he too had to learn them in order to compose poems freely. He added that if she doesn't know what intonation should be, he advised her to use the sounds she hears every day or objects she likes. Most importantly, she should control the unexpanded pronunciation she has been taught. She said the items she likes are sweets. She asked if it could be chocolate cake. He called it a good example and said that a poem about the amazing sweetness of chocolate cake sounded very appealing. She asked Kyan if he went to school when he was six. He told his story. He came from a temple orphanage. Fortunately, he took the educational courses the priests gave him. In addition to that, he had to study ancient literature and songs. The little girl wondered if this was the highest level of knowledge she had heard of not having to study much to become a butler. She told Cyan that she could see that he knew too much. He took that as a compliment and thanked her. He asked if those were all her assignments. She added that there was still this book left to read. They said she didn't need to learn table manners. Sioni asked the little girl if she was good at reading children's books, and she asked him if he had read all the children's stories. He gave her the answer that the priests weren't interested in magicians, and because of that he didn't get a chance to read them. It seemed to the little girl that Tayan became very sad when it came to the temple. I don't think she thought so. He offered to help her with the reading, but she refused. She said she was good at reading everything out loud. The little girl suggested to Haxayan since he hadn't read the book, maybe he'd be happy to listen to her read. He scared at her. Babe asked him what was wrong with him. He thanked her for the offer. He wondered what would happen to him if the duke and the young master caught him. Babe asked Tyan if he could be scolded for helping her with her homework. He gave the simple answer that it wasn't such a big deal in principle. He looked at the cover of the book. It said it was a tale of a bad magician and a good magician, the most famous children's story in the empire. The little girl said that her teacher had told her that she should definitely read it. Something about this was all very suspicious to me. Did you viewers think of that too? He said that the story was about the principality. The principality? She asked him again. I think the teacher had told her that before. She asked if one of them was a dark wizard. He said he was. She told him that a bad mage couldn't come from the duke's family. To which he replied that a duke does more than good. First of all, the legend of the good magician is the legend of the duchy. In other words, the good magician in the tale is like the beginning of a new one. Here's how. Once upon a time, a very bad magician and a good magician lived in the same empire. Ancient sorcerers that lavishly used magic stones were stronger than the existing ones. However, the bad mages who loved themselves harmed ordinary people using magic. Gathering all the power together, the people of the Emiria went against to make the bad mages pay for their sins. There were some good ones among them. A dark mage named Levelton took on all the good ones. Eventually, they split into two sides and fought each other to the last. This war, also known as the War of Vengeance, was enormous. In the end, the Empire won thanks to the help of the good mages, and the bad ones were executed. Only the good mages were on the left side. At His Majesty's orders to protect the common citizens, the good wizards began to hide their power and used it only for good purposes. The good wizard families were friends of the Empire. The bad wizards died and were buried. The end of the story. Butler said she read perfectly. Now she could read smoothly and without stopping. The little girl was glad of it herself. He said the story was familiar enough, but it was even more enjoyable to listen to as a fairy tale. He thanked her. He said that now he had an opportunity to learn something new. He was insanely grateful to the little girl. She had never yet received compliments in her life, but in this house she could always hear them. Whether it was compliments or warmth that warmed her heart, she thanked Taxian for it. This story seemed very strange to the little girl. She asked Taian if he thought the story was strange. He replied that he thought so too. They all said in one voice that the story was harsh. A lot of mages died anyway. If you think about it, they could have made it more sweet. Is everything in the story true? Asked the girl. He said it was true. The duke was the first mage to side with the people, which is why he has such authority. At that time, family status was determined by who sided with kings first. She thought, but it wasn't. It's just that the duke belongs to a symbolic family. He currently provides the empire with quite a bit of magical power.
In addition, the Duke can produce, sell, and import certain goods. These opportunities are unique to him because they are closely related to other rights and opportunities, so the royal family cannot take them away. Now the girl understands why Daddy is so rich. The butler said it was time to prepare dinner. He saw him and said that it was time for him to go to the kitchen. The little girl asked what kind of dessert he was going to make tonight. He said it would be chocolate cake. The little girl was thrilled. She wondered if maybe she should try writing a poem again. She kept thinking and thinking. What was there to come up with? And she thought and thought. Her face was magical. The baby was crying. Suddenly her father came in. She said hello to him. Hello, little one, he said. The baby seemed lighter and lighter to him. When is she going to gain weight and get a little bigger? Baby said she was gaining. Whenever Marion hugged her, she said she was getting heavier. Her father tells the baby that he will have to measure her height after all. He talks about, has she grown even an inch while she's been living here? He hasn't noticed that. Also, Hersa wished the little girl would always stay this small. The little girl asked him if he really wanted her to always be this way and why. He said he was fine with it a chick that is incapable of flying out of its nest. He warned her that dinner would be ready soon and it was time to go to dinner. In the meantime, she could change and go downstairs. The little girl went to change her clothes. The Duke spotted Tyan and called him in. Hex Tyan looked strange. The Duke asked him what happened to him. He suddenly jumped up and told the Duke that he was fine, but it wasn't on his face at all. Cullen noticed what was wrong with him, but he didn't understand. He usually looked like a statue. Somehow everything was suspicious to him, he asked to see. Zion told the Duke that he just wanted to give his mistress back her homework. He asked Seong what other homework was there, and then Hursug remembered the tutor who had given the little girl her homework. Hursug asked Tyan if he had had time to look at it yet. Tyan said, why should he look at her homework? He said it was on the pillow. He tried not to look. The Duke took him by the hand and ordered him to show it. Suddenly Jay came up and asked his father where his sister was and they began to watch the little girl's homework, which was a poem. The sound of the wheels, which I like. The sound of daddy coming home. The pounding, pounding sound. I like the sound of Jay calling to play. The squeak, the creaking of the dishes that Xiang washes. The sound of fast and delicious food. But my favorite of all is the sound of delicious, delicious cake. Jay, after watching the little girl's homework, said he was about to lose his mind. He found more mistakes in the words. Her father, on the other hand, said she was writing in big, incomprehensible letters. Her father said that, as expected, the genius talent just needs to be discovered. He said that he would invite some scientists to analyze the verse. Xiang thought that the Duke was going too far with these actions. Jade said the nice thing about this poem is that she tries to keep the lines rhythmic, except that the last line about the cake didn't sound good to him. Jade realized that the little girl wanted to write that way because she wanted to finish her homework. Seong asked Jade and Cullen not to tell the little girl that they had seen her poem, but they ignored it. Cullen said he had to keep it as a memento, and Jade suggested finding a frame to begin with. Jade asked his father, is a man capable of writing such a nice poem? He found the little girl's handwriting very charming. Cullen said that even a fairy herself couldn't be that adorable, so Letitia certainly wasn't human. Siang wondered if this conversation was going for better or for worse. He hadn't quite figured it out yet. Jade suggested using a magic spell to preserve this creation. Cullen said it was an excellent idea, and it was decided to preserve a rather valuable poem. Cool. Cullen said that having solved the problem, now they would talk about Kayan's tactless behavior. Haxian began to worry after these words from Cullen. He said that he really didn't watch the poem. Cullen said that wasn't the point. The fact was that he is in the poem, which shows his unabashedness. There's something that kept Cullen on his toes. Xiang asked if it wasn't the chocolate cake that would make them criticize him. Jay asked his father why he was at the top of the list, since Jake had been with Letitia the most, playing and spending time with her. Cullen replied to his son that it was simply because he was the head of the family. Xiang said that although he was mentioned in the third stanza, he was honored. By the way, he had to give that homework back to Leticia, for the mistress would be furious if she knew about it. Jay told Siong not to worry about it. After all, what is the reason for her anger? Cullen said they would make a copy of her masterpiece and send it to all their relatives so they could write positive reviews about it. Even publishing her poem in the paper wouldn't be fair at all. As a memento of her virginity, said the father. Kayan, however, told them in case they did, Leticia would resent them even when she grew up. Besides, if others read her poem, Kayan thought she would be very upset. Jade told her father that Xiang was right. Only family should know about this masterpiece. Jade thought, 
Jade said he would praise his sister for her efforts. Seong gave Jade advice not to overdo it. They reflected on the fact that in case they started griping about her so early, they might interfere with her. After all, her talent for writing poetry had only just begun to sprout. In the end, at least, Papsan somehow managed to convince them. Fizayan thought about the fact that if they found out about Mistress's diary, they would definitely try to publish everything she drew. He was sure of it. Exian definitely should have kept their reading today a secret. A few days later, Letitia was very angry. The butler asked the little girl what was wrong. Why was she croaking like that? He thought she didn't like the food. But the little girl said she didn't like her daddy and her little brother. Her father told the little girl that it couldn't be like that, she must have meant something else. He pointed his finger at Tayon and said it was all his fault. He was the one who read her poem. The little girl told him why he blamed everything on Tayon. She thought he would never do that. Jade apologized to his sister, and he said it was all this father's fault. The little girl had nothing to add. She said she had had enough and left. She said she went to get some fresh air. She couldn't believe they could read her homework, a homework poem. She begged to be allowed to die. Oh, our little girl got all upset. The little girl could tell that Cullen and Jade had secretly seen her homework. Jade suggested that the little girl learn it. Cullen, on the other hand, said that from now on chocolate cake would be the main dessert in their house. The little girl began to scream. She said she knew it and that she shouldn't have left her homework there. But shouldn't they apologize to her for reading her poem without permission? She was glad to have chocolate cake on the menu starting today. She said she would leave when Cullen and Jade had dinner. Her father knocked on her door and asked her to open it. She opened the door with a stubborn face and listened to him speak. Her father said he had something important for her. The little girl didn't know what to answer. She was very sad. Her father told her it was about something she liked very much. The little girl stared and wondered what it could be. Are they going somewhere? Or could it be a picnic or a circus? What if it's true? If Colin changes his mind because of her stubbornness, he told her about the school. She was shocked. She asked him to wait. He held the doors, and it pissed her off. She asked him what was wrong, and he said he wanted to send her to a private school, but she needed to talk to her doctor. The little girl asked her father, what about the semester? After all, enrollment in classes hadn't started yet. He told her that there was always a way. It might take some time because they don't just give permission though. He thought his daughter was smart enough to write fast. And if she went to school, she could learn a lot more about everything. It would be great to attend nobles. The little girl understood that such a school must be very expensive. But if she missed such an opportunity, Cullen might be resentful of her. Suddenly he said that if she didn't want to go, she didn't have to. The little girl didn't think about the answer anymore, but asked when she was going to go to school. Colin told his daughter that it was up to her. This semester was almost over and she could go there for two months and then decide what to do next year. The little girl said that was a good thing. She suddenly had a change of heart. Dad obviously didn't expect that. And she added that if Daddy didn't apologize for the poem, she wasn't going anywhere. What a sweetheart she is, after all. He said he'd never apologized to anyone before in his life. She suddenly realized she was in a hurry. She had become too brave after her father had told her he would take her anywhere. However, she should learn that in order for the most precious young miss in the universe to be happy. Forgive me, little one, her father told her. The little girl asked her father, he's not apologizing for getting caught up in this, is he? Her father told the princess that he was her daddy after all, and he would certainly be interested in her every move. He said he would ask her permission next time, just like a gentleman. She said, okay, that's very nice. He asked the little girl if she loved him, to which she gave a simple answer. She does. Of course she does. It was the lady who captured Cullen's heart. She asked if there were any of her peers at school. The little girl began to try on outfits. Marion said it was all wrong and asked the servants to bring other clothes. Marion asked the servants why she was wearing a white dress. Did they think she was a saint or something? It was as if she had come from the temple. She said, the little girl thought about what she was saying about the temple while she herself was serving in the temple. Marion said she knew this would happen. It's a great decision, she said. What she also said was that the little girl was going to school for the first time, so she asked the servants to dress her properly. She looked at the little girl in her dress and couldn't get enough of it. She was very much in awe of the little girl's beauty. Marion told the little girl that she was gorgeous. The maid said she would braid ribbons into the little girl's braids. Marion said that if she looked like a child, her school friends would look down on her. She asked the maid to add some volume. Marion said they would do without ribbons this time. 
a ribbon with a stone would do instead. Marian put the stone on the baby and said it would be much better. Cullen asked what was taking them so long. He added that the little girl had to look attractive. After all, it's time for the high society kids to know that his daughter is the most beautiful. Marion told Cullen that he did not understand anything. After all, children at that age are too sensitive. She said that on the first day of school it is not necessary to wear bright clothes. The little girl liked the outfit Marianne had chosen. She said she would go as Marianne dressed her because she always looked beautiful. Cullen didn't know if they were listening or not. Marianne said the little girl always said such wonderful things. How does she manage to live in such a crazy house? She thought she was crazy cute. Jade told Marianne to stop kissing his sister or she would go with a red cheek. Marianne advised the little girl to be sure to make friends at school. The little girl was madly eager to make new acquaintances. The princess' only friend was Walter. She wondered how he was and where he was now. She thought she owed him a lot. Marianne was curious as to what was going on at school. She had heard that many of the children were going to regular school. She thought it would be radically different from what she had imagined. A noble school is a prestige school where all the children of nobles go, Marianne said. Marianne asked her brother, that is, Cullen, what is the name of the school? He said it was called Madame Poland's Noble School. Her sister asked Cullen how he managed to get permission. She thought he had to sacrifice something for something like this. He said it was just connections, right. Marianne asked him if it was great, because she was worried. She wondered what kind of school it was, good or not. The little girl understood everything. She realized that the school was quite famous, just wonderful, she thought. Look at the baby, she's so cute. Cullen said it was time to go. She said goodbye to everyone, to the butler, to her older brother, and they left. The little girl asked Marion how many people were in this academy. Marion said about 30 to 40 or more. Bay asked why so many? Did she say the whole school or just this one class? Marion said that tuition there is quite expensive and family background is strictly regulated there. The little girl asked her father if she could get used to the place. Marianne couldn't understand why the little girl was so worried about it. Marianne told Cullen that she knew he wanted to do the best for his daughter, but that there were other more appropriate schools. Cullen asked Marianne why would he look for something else when they had already found a prestigious school. He added that his daughter was smart and deserved better. He didn't understand her at all. The little girl asked if it was true that learning was hard, to which Marianne told her that no, you don't have to worry about that. She added that teachers would find certain ways to teach her, but the little girl didn't understand what method she was talking about. Marianne said that many of the students at this school are, well, um, from royal or similar families, so there was nothing to worry about. They entered the school. They were already waiting on the doorstep. Madame Pauline greeted the Duke very warmly as he did her. He said he would be honest with her and confident in his daughter. He said that his daughter was the best and the smartest. He told Madame that he hoped her daughter would be treated well and properly. Madame Pauline said the rumors about him did not lie. She noticed that Cullen had changed. Madame asked the Duke if he wanted to patronize the little girl very much. He told Pauline that he just wants her to be cared for discreetly. He said he hoped for her understanding. The little girl said hello, made a bow, and said it was a pleasure to meet her, and said she was the daughter of the Duke of Cullen, and her name was Letitia. Madame Pauline said that she had before her a sweet and lovely lady. Madame hoped that she would get along with the students. The young lady's teacher would be appointed today. Madame told Letitia that in the meantime she could go into the classroom and meet the other students. She added that she was honored to meet the saint, even if only for a short time. Marianne said that she too was glad to see someone from a noble family after a long time. She thanked Madame Pauline for the invitation. Madame told Marianne that she must be sure of it she promised to take good care of the young lady. So this is what a noble woman looks like, thought the little girl. Marianne asked the little girl if she noticed that the woman was a man. The little girl was horrified. Madame Pauline pointed to the door and said she would show the little girl to the rest of the class. Her family said that in that case they would go and fetch the little girl a little later. They hugged the little girl, kissed her, wished her good luck, and left. Madame Pauline told the little girl that the classroom they were headed to was where her peers were. If all goes well, she will continue to study with them until she finishes school. The little girl was glad to hear this. She was glad to know that there would be kids just like her going to school with her. But she also thought about the fact that they would be different from her former friends. But she hoped to the last that she would make friends with them. They walked into the classroom. To the other students, Madame Pauline introduced our little girl. 
she told the class that they had a new classmate. She added that the young lady was from the Duke family. The little girl greeted everyone and said her name was Letitia, and she was the daughter of Duke Cullen Levelton. The students said that while there was no class, they could have tea with each other. The little girl was approached by a classmate and asked if it was true that she was the Duke's adopted daughter. The little girl said it was true. She introduced herself as Lavin. I didn't like that girl from the first minute. The little girl told Lavin that it was a pleasure to meet her. In response, she heard silence. Lavin asked the princess if he knew what class she was in now. She said it was a class for noble children from ages 8 to 14. Lavin wasn't sure, but most of the class is from the royal family. Half of half means that there are only two people here from the royal family. Lavin asked why a child like Letitia is here. Letitia said that the adults, her family, in particular her dad, had decided that. She said that if she was curious, she could ask them herself. Levin obviously didn't like our little girl. She looked very angry. Levin said that in that case, if the Duke brought the little girl to them, well, they wouldn't kick her out, even with their powers. But she asked me to get one thing straight. She said they were the future of this world, and unlike her, they had noble blood. The little girl looked upset. I felt sorry for her. She thought to herself that if you think about it, the kids on the streets were just as mean. There was just something wrong with them. The little girl told Lavin that in that case, if they are the future of this world, that sounds great. Lavin said yes, great. As it was, she wanted to tell Baby something more interesting. They decided to put on a play at the Royal Palace at the annual festival. The little girl heard it and became very interested in what she had to say next. Lavin told Letitia that she had no idea how serious it all was. Everyone who plays the lead roles in the play succeeds in society. That's what her mother told her. And then the little girl realized this is what advice from mothers looks like. Levin said that since she came to them late, she would no longer be able to give her a part to perform at the festival. Besides, she didn't know if she could read with that background. Maybe knew right away that Levin was afraid of the fact that Letitia might take the lead role. In any case, she knew nothing about it and she was no longer interested. She told Levine that she would not be in the play. Levin asked Letitia what she would be doing all this time while others were rehearsing. She reflected on the fact that she had read quite a few books in her past life, and it did her good. She suggested something more interesting to Lavin. She asked if she could do a screenplay. It was the perfect piece strategy, it seemed to me. Our little girl is good, a script editor, Lavin asked again. Then some girl came up and asked who it was. Lavin quickly shut the girl's mouth and told her to shut up immediately. Otherwise, Letitia might think she was uneducated. By the way, the girl's name was Angel. The little girl took out her text and told them to look at the lines she had written. The little girl began to read the lines. You're like a lavender in May, you're like a rose goddess. The little girl added that it sounded a little strange and it would be hard to remember them. She suggested making it a little simpler still. The kids asked how she wanted to change them. She came up with this idea. You are much more beautiful than flowers. My feelings for you are brighter than all roses. She asked if that was okay. That line was from a little girl's novel she had read sometime in a past life. Lavin called it an interpretation. Angel asked this girl what it meant. Lavin said she didn't really know, but she had heard that all the students at this academy were capable of it. She explained that our little girl had reworked the classics into a modern twist. The little girl told them honestly that she has recently been dubbed a prodigy because of her language skills. She's not interested in doing plays at all, but if they need an editor, she said they can go to her. She also added that they also need someone to oversee the whole process. Levin knew right away that the little girl wanted to be the theatrical consultant for their play, and he's more in charge than the actors. They needed to talk it over, and they went to talk it over with the other students. They talked about her being a prodigy. Some girl in the class said she had never seen people like that before, so she really is smart, they thought. They thought it was very serious. This commoner had invaded their space and they didn't like it, but she seemed nice and kind, they appreciated that. Some girl in class asked Levin what she was going to do about the little girl's appearance. Are you out of your mind? Levin yelled at her and covered her mouth. Some girl yelled at Levin that it was all about her. After all, Levin said our little girl should be kicked out, even though she is the Duke's daughter, the girl will forever be a commoner. Levin shouted in her excuse that it was not her fault, for others thought so too, that our little girl should be kicked out. The little girl turned to them, saying that she could hear perfectly well what they were saying. What a turnaround! Levin screamed that they too said that if they lost their status if they played with her, why were they all blaming her now? 
The second girl told Laven to cut the crap. She reminded her of Lady Rose, who was abandoned by Duke because of his adopted daughter. Afterward, this girl remembered that it was Reddy Rose's secret and she asked her not to tell it to anyone. Baby, meanwhile, realized how silly these girls were. Baby heard everything they were talking about and the girls, meanwhile, were in shock. Levin screamed that she was imagining things. She added that she had recently learned something about her at the ball. Unfortunately, she was not allowed to divulge that person's name. She said that people were saying that the little girl was manipulating Duke into insulting the noble ladies. Levine added that according to him, she is a very bad person. What kind of person's name is not to be divulged? Wasn't it Lady Rose by any chance that wanted to sell her to a circus group? A very tactless person, whispering to the children and spreading all sorts of rumors about her. This person graduated from high school. They will always be loyal to students from their academy. Laven said that's why they need to talk things over. The little girl said to do what they wanted. She didn't care about anything. It looked like she was going to have a hard time making friends with high status little girl thought. She was already beginning to doubt her father's decision, who thought she would do well here. She doubted she would get an education at this school. She didn't know if they even had classes. It was one thing or the other. A tea party, a ball, a festival, that sort of thing. Lavin turned to the little girl and said they had made up their minds. As everyone already knows, she is Duke's adored daughter. She sent that to be frank. It's insulting for them to be in a relationship with someone like the babe. The babe knows perfectly well that she cannot replace the Duke's own daughter. Lavin has told Our Lady that if she will do what they say, then so be it they will let her join their circle. Do what you say? The girl thought about it. Some girl said there was going to be a pet walk in the greenhouse at Central Park today. She asked our little girl if she had a pet and what kind. The little girl said she didn't have a pet. Levin said that in that case she was not allowed. If she had even the slightest pet, they wouldn't have invited her anyway. So they told her not to get her hopes up. Levin said there's a ball next week and they have an opera scheduled. Until they recognized the little girl as a friend, any event would take place without her participation. She was very uncomfortable. I understand her. Lagan told her not to get upset with her. If she follows their orders this month, maybe she will join them. Lagan said it would be really great if the little girl liked all the girls in the class. For a toddler, these rules were too strange for Lavin. Being the one who walks into class first and leaves last. Writing sincere letters and handing out gifts to her close friends. And also not to refuse their requests. She asked Lavin if she thought that was okay. Lagan said it was okay for her, for a kid like Letitia to make new friends. Sort of a status upgrade of sorts, she asked her if she thought so, but our little girl was very angry. She didn't like those kinds of rules. She knew that these kids were older than her, so they had to be 10 years old. What did they even do to talk like that? She didn't understand. Leticia wondered if she could join them after all this scrutiny. Laven replied that she should be glad she did, for it is not an offer she gives to everyone. The little girl realized that she just had to be patient. She must not let herself be broken. This she understood all too well. In spite of such a tempting offer, the little girl would probably refuse. Playing at home with her little brother would be much more interesting to her. Lavin asked the little girl what she meant by that. Letitia said that if it had been a test of friendship for friendship, it would have gone nowhere. She didn't want to become someone else's servant. She took it back. Lavin said she had been good to her. Lavin said, as expected, ordinary people don't know what manners are. They shouted in Letitia's wake that she was arrogant. The little girl knew it was happening again. Getting along with people like that was definitely not her thing. Lady Letitia was informed that the Duke or father had come to fetch her. The girl looked at him with a distressed look. It was obvious that she was being abused here. The children were staring out the window at our boys. They seemed very interested. Aristocratic families are so strange. She thanked her father for coming to pick her up. He asked the little girl how she was doing at school. She didn't tell him the truth and said she was having fun. Apparently, she didn't feel comfortable telling the truth. The Duke asked Leticia if she had made friends with the class. She answered him by telling him that she was just walking around school today. He asked why so. Was that all she was doing? He wanted to know. She replied that they had a tea party. He asked if she liked it. She said she liked it. And she talked a lot with her new friends. He seemed to think there was something she wasn't telling him. He said she felt like she was about to cry. She didn't know what to say to her father. Instead of being a worthy daughter of a duke, she became a laughing stock to her classmates, and their statuses were far different. She thought that the duke would think that she had just come to school for the first time and had already managed to ruin everything. She was very much afraid of that and worried about it, 
so she just told her father that it was okay. He asked his daughter to tell the truth, whatever it was, he asked what really happened, he asked her to be a good girl. She told him briefly that she had been told not to come to Saturday's meeting. She added that her classmates were going to play together even outside of school. Hersa was thinking after these words, she said she had some problem. People come to this meeting with pets, Hersa was surprised. She said that this meeting should be with pets like dogs or cats, for example. They walk together and have tea in the garden, but the little girl didn't have a pet. And now she's not ready to raise one. She said she would be fine and she wouldn't be upset if she wasn't at this meeting. This Saturday she said she would rather spend time with her family. She knew her father was a very busy man, so she asked about his plans for that Saturday. He said he wouldn't be too busy, and asked how about combining the two things together. But the girl didn't know what she was talking about. He said she could meet her friends and spend time with her family. It is such a long day after all. He also told his little girl that he forgot to tell her that he had a pet. The little girl didn't know that and said she hadn't even seen him. He said he lived in the woods. And then she remembered the words of the butler who had told her never to go near the woods. It was one of the forbidden places Cheyenne had told her about. He decided to lend the little girl his pet so that she could go for a walk. He told her not to worry, because for the dukes it is okay to come to a meeting uninvited, and everyone wants to get to know them better and sometimes touch a duke or his family. He said that these people are overwhelmed with emotion and they cry. That's the way the world works. If she went, everyone would appreciate it. The little girl wondered if Jade or Cullen had ever cried. The little girl asked her father if it was an animal. Did it crawl on four legs or what? He said that this pet was very cute. Then the little girl knew it was okay, she hoped. She was afraid he might have caught some wild animal, but she really hoped he didn't. Time flew by quickly and Saturday came. The little girl was shocked that this pet was in their home. She didn't understand whether such a creature could be kept in the capital city. Jade told the little girl that everything that belonged to her father also belonged to her. So he asked her to stop worrying and take this pet to the meeting. His name is Fifi. He said that if you call his name and touch his fur, he will calm down. Cheyenne said that in case she didn't like this pet, there were other pets. The little girl was interested in other pets as well. Besides those that herd in the water, there is also an elephant that was given and brought from another continent. However, he gave him to the zoo but she can take him back from there. He's such a cutie. The baby decided to just be quiet. Cheyenne said not to worry baby because Fika doesn't bite. She told him that she wasn't afraid of it. She had some kind of deja vu. Cheyenne told the little girl to hurry and asked her to get in the carriage or she would be late. The little girl asked Sheehan how he managed to stay calm. Jade went out and turned to Letitia. He already knew that she had heard about everything. But the little girl didn't know what she was talking about. She saw his clothes and didn't understand what was going on. She didn't understand what was going on with the three of them. She knew it was bad that her classmates were ingorizing her, but she wasn't upset. She didn't know what to make of this encounter. Her older brother said he would go with her, but the little girl didn't understand what it was all about. He reasoned that he would be helpful when she met her classmates. Sometimes a guy with a slight age difference can help with that. The boys were just having a quiet conversation. Not too long ago at the prom, her mom said that when she grows up she will inherit it all. And then our little girl shows up with you know who? A tiger. They sure didn't see it coming. They started screaming and running away. Calling for help, asking to be rescued. They didn't know what it was, especially Lavin. The little girl said her daddy lent her his pet. His name is Feifei. He was raised by daddy. Letitia was shocked. She asked if Duke had bred him. Tiger approached Lavin. Her breathing stopped. She begged and screamed for him not to eat her. Jade said he doesn't eat people unless his master orders him to. He also said that he understood there was going to be a meeting with the pets and he wanted to join in. But it turned out to be a lot more boring than he thought. Lavin saw Jade and immediately her heart started pounding harder. And then the little girl came to her shock too when she found out that Lavin was a princess. It turns out she had a fight with the princess. Jade told Lavin that he had heard that she had been very nice to his little sister, so he came to meet her. She said she was going to be friends with the little girl, but she turned her down. And why lie to me, I wonder? Jade said that no matter how young she was, she just needed to be a little more savvy to live at the palace. He asked her what kind of daughter she was. Jade told Lavin that there are so many people in the royal family who can replace her. But in the prince's family, Letitia is the only daughter. If she continues to behave this way, the relationship between the prince and the royal palace could go bad. 
He asked if she thought that in that case his majesty would walk and cherish her like that. He asked her to behave properly, then she would be treated well too. He called the little girl over and told her to say hello to her friends. There were tears in their eyes, they were so happy to see her. It was the first time the little girl had seen Jade like that. After all, Jade belongs to the prince's family. He is like Cullen, he is like Cullen. Babe said hello to Lavin and thanked her for being so nice to her. She added that she didn't even know that Lavin was a princess, she wanted to be friends with her. Lavin said that she had told Leticia that she was a princess, but the little girl said she only found that out today. Anyway, she thanked Levin for not inviting her. Just like Daddy told the little girl, there's nothing interesting here. So she left. After all, Daddy had asked her to come home early. She also added something else. Next time she asked to meet each other with a smile on her face, she would appreciate it if Levin smiled first. So she left, and Levin was reassured by her girlfriends. She saw that Levin couldn't even say a word. Letitia understood that because she was the daughter of the prince they were afraid of her. The little girl made sure that the tiger was docile. At one point he bit her a little. She noticed his sharp fangs and there were so many more. Pippi looked cute, but when he opened his mouth, she got scared. Jade said that Pippi was asking to be stroked on his belly in this way. The little girl now understood what it was all about. She asked how did the prince manage to tame such a huge beast? Jade said that dark magicians knew how to put animals to sleep. Last year, the duke went hunting and saved this tiger, which had been injured by a hunter's arrow. While he was healing it, he naturally tamed it. The little girl realized that she shouldn't be afraid of the tiger. It looked so soft and cool. Baby knew that she would soon become addicted to such fluffiness of the tiger. Jay asked if she was afraid of the tiger. Baby said she wasn't, because Jade and her father said he wasn't dangerous. He asked how her mood was. Babe said she was fine, although she was a little worried about the consequences. He asked what she was afraid of. She said that they were all high-ranking, that is, classmates, and she was an ordinary person. She thought about dropping out of school. Surely her classmates wouldn't do anything to her for fear, but she would feel awkward when she met them at school. Jay reminded her that she could quit school at any time, and if she had to, she could get everyone to quit except her, so he told her not to worry. But if they were still hurting her, and she didn't tell anyone about it, he'd scold the little girl as the next head of the family. She thanked Jade for coming with her. Our baby girl has changed. Before, if she'd met such mean girls who bullied her, she'd have thought there was nothing to be done about it. No, she would even try to fit in with them herself. After all, there's a huge difference between them. But now it's different. It hurts her to tears to be ignored. But everyone in the prince's house treats her so well. She would be embarrassed in front of them if she allowed herself to be hurt. She is no longer the type to be treated disparagingly. This winter landscape outside her window no longer seems so cold to her. After all, there are people who care about her. Thanks to though she has been able to change. Now no matter what happens, she has confidence. Maybe it's a winter miracle. The end. Wow, I just love this manhwa. It captivated me with its compelling story, unique characters, and beautiful artwork. I couldn't tear myself away from reading it and can't wait for the sequel anymore. This is definitely one of the best manga I've read. Thank you for watching the final part and the final chapter of this manhwa. No need to comment here because you must agree this manhwa is great. The rating of this manhwa on the platform is almost 10 out of 10, which was worth proving. I thank you for being there, someone to subscribe, someone to leave positive comments, and someone just watched.